Um, I did a stand-up gig right when I moved to New York. Now, like, I don't know when, when it was, 2011 or something like that. I, I did a stand-up gig for a political action committee, and a guy came up afterwards, and he was like, hey, you're really funny. Do you like poker? And I was like, I, I'm kind of, I, I can play poker. I don't play it regularly. And he's like, well, I, I play some poker with some guys. Uh, they're hedge fund billionaires. They just, they, it's like a, a small buy-in, but, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a way of equalizing everything because they can Define actually... Define small. <laughs> $200 was the buy-in, which okay. for a hedge fund billionaire is pretty small if you think about it. Uh, yeah. That's like, that's just enough to be like, oh, well, I, I, $200 even to a billionaire is is like, well, that's more than a hot dog. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. It, but, like, but, he, but he was like, yeah, they, they like playing this. It's kind of like they, they like playing poker because it's a situation where they actually can lose. Uh, like it's, it's actually this kind of weirdly egalitarian space that they can occupy. And while they're in it, they're just guys. They just want to play poker. They don't want to be tycoons or anything, but we, we all play poker once a week. Would you want to join us sometime? And I was like, I will pay $200 just to see what a room full of billionaires looks like. I'm genuinely curious as to like, do they have money falling out of their pockets? Do they look like Mr. Monopoly? Like, do they, are there, are there like Epstein style yeah. ladies in the back? Like, um, Pretty, pretty <laughs> yeah. standard poker game, incidentally. I went in first time. I, like, I looked at it exactly how you should look at gambling, which is I am planning to lose this amount of money for an interesting experience. So I went in going, I'm just going to lose $200. So I played real fast and loose because I was like, I know I'm going to lose it. And they didn't know what I was doing, so I actually did okay. Like I think I made $100. And then I played it twice more and got wiped out every time very early. And by the third time, I was like, this is a very expensive hobby for me. I, I do not have two hundred dollars <laughs> a week that I could blow. This, this was this like, was in your in in your era of selling books for groceries, right? This is very yeah. This is this is right out of that. Like I I at this yeah. point I think I I now have gainful employment, but I'm also thirty in New York, and you know I'm living in a converted dumbwaiter with three other people hot bunking a twin bed or whatever. And so just two, $200 a week is not really within my budget. So I, I, yeah. I just kind of politely got out of it. And I now look back and go, that would have been a better investment than my college degree if I'd kept yeah. doing that. Like if I'd taken out loans and just been like, I'm just going to, yeah, that's fine. I, I lose 200. I, I do it like twice a month or something. That would be a really good thing at this point. If I could just call up five different hedge fund billionaires and go, hey, I've got a really funny idea. Uh, can you can you float me three hundred thousand dollars? You'll you'll find it funny, I promise. Because like there there like, is there is a, a, a reality it. to and and for any of the young people who are listening to this, if you hang out around people who do a certain thing, by accident you will just end up with that thing. Just little elements of it. And Including so, hedge funds? Money. Yes, no. <laughs> if Eaton were in that room, he would accidentally find himself with a boat. Yeah. Like you just you don't know why it's the it's what, the case, what, but what, one what, day what, he's on a boat and that's and that's the the reality of it. I can tell you what what what, what probably would have happened. I, I'm frankly I'm kind of surprised at this point in my career I'm not getting paid to do public speaking more than I am because I'm I'm a trained comedian and I know there are lots of DC outfits, think tanks, and political action committees that have annual galas and stuff. And I would be very good at hosting such an event because I could do the political stuff, but I'm very funny. So I'm kind of surprised that hasn't happened more. I do get invited to do regional stuff, but I don't want to, I'm already traveling enough. I don't really want to go to, to Indiana or Minnesota. No offense to either of those states. It's just, I'm, I'm kind of trying to concentrate my activity in, in a couple of, uh, of cities. But like, if those hedge fund guys had become buddies with me, I'm sure there would have been some like mini Davos type thing. They were always talking about Telluride in Colorado. Like, Telluride. Yeah. I'm guessing there would have been some event in Telluride where they'd be like, Heaton, do you want to be the, the comedic relief for this event? We'd fly you down. We'd, we'd put you up. You'd get a chalet. And we'd give you, I don't know, if you can slum it, it like 10,000. Something like that would have happened, right? And I like absolutely look back. Stupid Heaton. I think you're poker. thinking, you're still, you're thinking too low. Like you just would have wound up like in some sort of place where money would have fallen out of the air. Like I've long been friends with people who have been in video production. And literally just this weekend, I had to clear out about 10 years worth of equipment that I've accidentally just f has fallen into my life. 
cords, uh, uh, switchers. There's a three monitor array that's currently sitting on my uh, on my my ground here. Two different uh, mixers. I wound up keeping one. I had two others that are just sitting there. There's a full gaming PC that is in the corner. <laughs> a gigantic monitor that I have no idea what to do with. And it's just because I've hung around. It's like that with money, friends. Find people with money, and money will just fall out of their pockets, and you can pick it up. Sometimes they give it to you because they're bothered you're not picking it up fast enough. <laughs> when I was in college, I came up with my, my game plan for networking because I was hanging out with all the type A ladder climber people, and, and you'd go to a party, and you could see them. They'd scan the room for who was going to mm-hmm. be the most effective at getting them what they wanted, and I always found that to be a very <laughs> – Icky. I agree. The, the face Jen is making was my, my perspective as well. So I very decidedly went, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to seek out people that I think will help my career. I'm going to seek out people based on how interesting they are. That's going to be the Heaton metric. I'm going to find interesting people, surround myself with interesting people. And it has availed a lot of career opportunities. But also, maybe I fucked up. Maybe I should have been just going for hedge fund billionaires. Because I mean, as it is right both. now, like, like as it is now, if you're like Heaton, like, like truthfully, do you know anybody that's a professional treasure hunter or former circus ringleader? The answer is yes. I, I, I can do that. I yeah. do have a Rolodex yeah. with a lot of colorful characters in it, but not a lot of hedge fund billionaires at this point. Yeah, that's a problem. What about you, Jen? Is your Rolodex stuffed with uh, hedge fund billionaires? No, actually, real, real, when I real was Gordon Gecko types, <laughs> money was, never sleeps. When I was younger, I knew some people with like serious money in their families, but oh yeah, because you grew up in a place where a bunch of rich kids were. Oh yeah, like yeah. I used to hang out in Laguna Beach and Emerald Bay, like Mossimo and Lori Laughlin were my friends' neighbors, and um, the houses that I've been in, you wouldn't even believe. So I, I was around that kind of money, but I also. I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable with the idea of trying to like leech on to the wealthy ones. So a few of them I genuinely liked and spent time with them, but then, you know, I just. Yeah, no, you don't leech. Because leech, is, that's a problem. If you're just hanging around, again, money but falls out. It yeah, does. Now that I'm 40, no. though, totally like, it when, does. when you're the help, like I was, I was waiting tables this was in college, but I was waiting tables and hanging out in that same community with very, very rich people. And for me, going out to dinner is like, you know, rubies or Chipotle, like that level, you okay, know, like yeah, 10 bucks. Here's... They want to go to the steakhouse on a Tuesday and sure. I couldn't afford to hang. And they weren't going to pay for me. I wasn't going to allow that. So it was like impossible for me to hang. Yeah. And that was really you, you, hard for that, me. That's an awkward moment, though, because... You don't really have anything to offer except for one specific thing if Nothing. you are hanging around rich people in your late teens and early 20s. Yeah. What's uh, that? It, mm. yeah. <laughs> Use your imagination. Uh, how, how come but I wasn't? Many, girls, many women, I had nothing many, to offer. Many, many women make a very good living in Miami Beach with this one one weird yeah. trick. Uh, but but the, the older you get, the more that your friends, I'm telling you, it happens. How many billionaires do you have in your role? I don't have a lot of billionaires. I have a couple millionaires. I have some millionaires. A couple but millionaires, I'm, but not a lot of billionaires. At now this point, I'm, I'm I don't 40. consider millionaires that rich because, I mean, at this point, a middle class lifestyle, you need a quarter of a million. So I mean, in Biden's economy, sure. I, yeah. I, I need to up my game. I'm, hey, li- listeners, listen. If there's any billionaires here, I am totally willing to sell out some of my friends. I'm 40 now. I'm willing to cut a deal. <laughs> this guy, Josh Jennings, has been like towing an anchor behind my car for 10 years. What has what he given me other than a kidney? Other than that one kidney, what does that man give him? That not one a dollars. stingy kidney. Darren, Darren, uh, I'll, I'll yeah. drop Darren. His wife I like, but Darren will totally drop for a billionaire. <laughs> uh, Tom Merritt, I'm going to say $40,000. If you've got $40,000 in the bank, we'll drop Tom Merritt for <laughs> you. You'll sell out Merritt. Cut it. Yeah. Yeah. Cut I will not sell Double any anchor. of these humans. I love them all. <laughs> um, I can't give you guys any billions, but I do have a gift, probably for Justin since you're not here, Andrew. Mm-hmm. But um, one of our lovely listeners sent us hot sauce that apparently I'm too big of a weenie to actually put I on I gave any food. you that hot sauce. I didn't look at the, the number of flames on this one because it's a garlic shiitake hot sauce. And I just figured it would have like a little kick. Like, no, it kicked me in the ass. So like. This is yellow bird, so, uh, yellow bird hot <laughs> sauce. Yeah. It is a local Austin, I think San Marcos, Texas brand. Uh, it is great. It I is will take so them. good. So I gave you, I know you like 
the ghost pepper one. Yeah. I accidentally took one that was hotter than I expected. I love the other ones. The agave one, I'm putting it on everything. Um, we got a nice little, like, taster packet. Um, there were, like, five of them, of yeah. them in there. Jim, so I, will, I do I love it. shout out. But these Trade were you. intense. So if you like really spicy stuff... I would go with these. Jen, I don't yeah, even like spicy handle. stuff, but I will trade you my friend Mohit for that. <laughs> 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 I, I, that's where I am. Deal. <laughs> From Austin, Texas. I'm Jennifer Brady. Uh, and from a... Uh, where are you in Oklahoma? I'm at my parents' house. Fuck bunker. I'm, I'm in the fuck from bunker. From his parents' house in <laughs> Oklahoma. I'm Andrew Heaton. And I'm Justin Robert Young on this edition of the program. Oh, and we're not wrong. Everything's going crazy today. On this edition of the program, we're going to talk about the Trump convictions. You may or may not have heard. We're breaking news here that a week ago, the former president of the United States was convicted on 34 felonies. We will discuss that as well. As our trip, just just in case that news was too fresh, <laughs> we're going to talk about our experience at the Libertarian Party a week and a half ago. But I think there's there's actually some some a little news peg. We might be actually breaking news on this show because of the uh, conversation around the Libertarian Party and one member of our panel. I won't spoil it. Oh, okay. That'll be in our second I might know segment. What this is, yeah. Yeah, you might. You might. You, yeah, look, he's politically relevant, this okay. Heaton guy. We'll get to that, though. Okay. I was gonna, it can't possibly be me. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, you were elected. You were drafted to the Libertarian ticket. You were running for Secretary of Agriculture, <laughs> which the Libertarian. Well, I mean, based on what I witnessed, that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> so. Let's uh, swing on over to Manhattan. Donald Trump was found guilty in a Manhattan court of 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. The charges stem from the attempt to cover up a $130,000 hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. Trump falsely labeled these reimbursements to his lawyer as legal expenses, according to the jury. The jury also concluded that he did this to conceal another crime violating both New York State's election laws and or the federal election laws. Trump plans to appeal the verdict, maintaining that the trial was politically motivated. Trump will be sentenced on July 11th, only four days before the GOP convention in Milwaukee. Following his conviction, uh, Trump has successfully turned his legal challenges into a fundraising boon. Within 24 hours, his campaign raised nearly $35 million, primarily from small-dollar donors. His campaign has since said that his May fundraising total between his campaign and the Republican National Committees was 140000 and the total with all Trump-affiliated organizations was $290 million in May alone. His opponent, President Joe Biden, has stayed quiet publicly on the matter, although in a closed-door donor dinner... Biden called Trump a, quote, convicted felon for the first time and said his attack on the court, prosecutor and judge have been reckless. So we will start with Mr. Heaton. I got three questions for you. You can take any one of them in any order. Was this a fair trial? What should Donald Trump's sentence be? And do you think that this will affect the election? Great questions. I'll take them in order. Um, the trial that just take pla took place in New York is a poorly constructed law that was on the New York books that was applied by a selective prosecutor. And for those two reasons, I do not think that the Trump, uh, that, that Donald Trump had a fair shot, uh, and I would acquit him in an appeal on, uh, on due process grounds. Uh, I would not have brought this to trial. I thought it was a weak case to begin with, um, Federal prosecutors agreed with me, incidentally. Merrick Garland had the opportunity to do this. He decided against it. Uh, and so I, I think in terms of the, the law itself, which was not concocted by the courts, but was made by New York state law, it was a weird funhouse mirror law to begin with that, that is very bizarre uh, in that you, you're proving the, the, the crime that was done in the service of another crime, but you don't have to specify what the underlying crime was, nor did they make an attempt to. The, the court case that just occurred, Alvin Bragg did not specify what the underlying crime was. He hinted 
that it, it could be campaign finance reform or campaign finance laws. It could be these other things. That's very strange to me, that, that any defendant would not have the opportunity to be able to mount a defense for the, the underlying crime that they're being prosecuted on. So those are, those are weird laws. Um, I do want to say, while I would not have brought it to trial and I would acquit Donald Trump if, if this were brought to appeal and I was judging on it, I also think that the, the Trump um, stumpers are going too far in, in how much they describe this as a kangaroo court. I agree with them that selective prosecution happened, that Alvin Bragg went after Donald Trump. He said so when he was running for DA. I agree with the Trump people on that. I also agree with them that it's a very weird law and that it appears to have been selectively prosecuted. I, I think that they're going too far in castigating Judge Merchant. Uh, as a corrupt judge, I think that that is overstepping it. The reason that they're saying that is twofold, from what I've been able to tell. He made a $35 contribution to a pro-Biden political action committee. Um, that is not something he should have done. That was a dumb move. That, that does indicate a level of impropriety on behalf of a jurist. Shouldn't have done that. It is nowhere near any type of statutory obligation to recuse himself. There is no legal or ethical threshold on the books in New York that would require him to, to turn down this trial based on the $35 contribution that he made. Uh, his daughter is a, uh, a, a donor monger. I don't know which, uh, a donor raiser. What's the, what's the word I'm looking for? Bundler. Justin? Bundler. Bundler. She's, yeah, something like, she, she raises I like money donor from, monger. I think we need monger. to stick with that one. I, I think that's actually good. Her, his daughter is a donor Just monger. at the donor docks, you know. Uh, just finding, monging. Finding the donors in nets and bringing them to market. Yeah. Uh, his, his, uh, his daughter is a donor monger, and she's been able to raise money uh, based on the trial. But that doesn't have any influence on the judge. And I, I, saw, I thought the same thing, by the way, with Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. Now, if Joe Biden did something regarding Hunter Biden, he should be prosecuted for it. But if it's Hunter Biden that was able to get on the board uh, of the energy company in Ukraine, Burisma. using his da dad's name, thank you, Burisma, using his dad's name, if that's Hunter Biden doing that, it's not on the dad. So uh, same thing. And then the other thing that the Trump campaign would bring up, uh, or that Trump has specifically brought up, uh, and, and very specifically as he was leaving the court based on the conviction, uh, Trump said, um, you know, this was corrupt judge. It was rigged from the beginning. This took place in a district that was 95% Biden voter. We tried to get it moved to a different district. They wouldn't let us do it. Uh, they're, they're, they're cookie cutting. The, the implication is that they're, they're cookie cutting the jury in order to arrive at a, a preordained outcome. And it's kind of the judicial uh, version of gerrymandering. That is also overstated. Um, you, you prosecute somebody in the district that the crime took place. You don't prosecute somebody in another district elsewhere. It's, it's very rare to do that. And, and it would also indicate that you are, you are able to disqualify people based on how they're voting, which is not a can of worms we want to open up. Uh, and it also would really castigate the entire jury process. I mean, the whole jury process is built around the idea that the average citizen is capable of making a informed, impartial decision on, on a trial. Uh, and, and saying that, like, how you voted would preclude your ability to make such a decision is, is a stretch too far. So TLDR, uh, this should not have been brought to trial. It should be acquitted. He should not serve jail time, and the conviction should be reversed. I agree with all of that. But I think that the rhetoric around it saying that America has descended into a banana republic, that America has, uh, you know, the, the judicial system is inherently corrupt, et cetera, et cetera, I think that that is very overstated and is going too far to the point of delegitimizing the courts. Uh, I think I've already answered your second question, Justin, which is I, I don't think he should yeah. save any time for this. Uh, and then in answer to your third point, I think that this is all going to incredibly benefit Donald Trump's campaign. Um, I think that the people that were, uh, as, as we've pointed out multiple times here, there's not a lot of people that were on the fence about Joe Biden or Donald Trump at this point. Everybody kind of has their opinion on it. In terms of people that were going to be shaken loose by Trump's behavior, I think that January 6th and all of the judicial uh, uh, attempts to steal the election uh, were the things that were going to knock those people loose. Uh, I think this rather complicated, highly contentious court case that a lot more people are skeptical of uh, is not going to be the thing that does that. I don't, I don't think you're going to see people that were okay with the president trying to get entire counties ballots thrown out, like blue counties thrown out, not recounted, but thrown out in order to sway swing states and use the judiciary to steal the election. People that were okay with that are not suddenly going to have a problem that he's a felon in this rather convoluted process. But I do think you're going to see people that look at this and rightly go, there's something fishy about this trial. 
Uh, the DA ran on indicting him. It's a really weird, complicated, it's hush money, but because it was done in, in the service of a crime that we don't have to prove, it's now a felony. But if, if we hadn't come up with that weird jujitsu move, it would have been a misdemeanor and it would have also been outside of the statute of limitations. Like it's, it's a weird looking thing, right? So I think you're going to see a lot of people that uh, were never Trumpers that are kind of warming up uh, to Biden, and you're going to see like a fair amount of libertarians now, uh, and folks like that that were like a pox on both your houses that are going to look at this as the judiciary has gone too far, and we have to send a very clear message to rebuke the Democrats not to engage in lawfare. Rightly or wrongly, I think there's a lot of people that are going to do that. So I'm going to make a prediction, Justin. Uh, okay. I'm going to predict Donald Trump's going to win the popular vote this time around, and this will be in no small small part because of this decision. Uh, I, I don't know that he's going to win the electoral vote, and I don't think we'll really have a clear view on that until we get closer to the election, if not the night of the election. But I think you're going to see enough aggravated Republicans. It's usually and, when we find out who won the election. Is election. Yeah, but like, okay, in, in terms bold, of being able bold to— Bold, bold statement in here. In terms <laughs> of being able to call it, in terms of being able to call it, like, uh, um, I think that that's going to be a lot more of a nail-biter. Uh, but but what, yes. I'm, what I'm going to say is I think you're going to see a lot of people in California that otherwise would go, um, California's going to vote blue regardless, I don't really care, that are going to turn up to vote for him. It won't affect the Electoral College, but it will affect the popular vote. And so I, I think that this is going to spectacularly benefit Trump in terms of the actual campaign for 2024. Jen? Disagrees with almost everything you said. <laughs> Okay. Um, the part, the part where I do agree, and I've always been uncomfortable with this, is when a guy, being the DA, runs on like I'm going to go after this dude, and then goes after this specific dude. Like, seems don't a little love political. That. Yeah, it's a little icky. Um, but that said, you know, I didn't. Uh, full disclosure, I did not follow the details of this case, even though CNN made it very easy if you wanted to, um, because I'm not MAGA and I'm not you know, inflicted with Trump derangement syndrome. So what I decided to do with this was let the jury decide. And I've been through enough jury selection processes that I know that both sides get a say in who those jurors are. And I had a question, you know, I know that Trump's lawyers got to, you know, help pick and choose who they were, but there was some reporting on who these people were. We don't know their names, but they did have a questionnaire, like, where do you get your news from? And juror number two gets her news for or his or her news from uh, Truth Social. <laughs> and, so, and MSNBC. <laughs> no, that person, it was Truth no, Social was, and was, Twitter. And, as it well was as those MSNBC. two. It was, it, it was a very eclectic for that specific juror. That juror was a, a tremendous fascination. Uh, uh, but well, in the chart that I saw, there yes. was only two things marked, and MSNBC was not uh, one of them. It, it, but it, just, was, it was also MSNBC. Just the fact that this person signs on to Truth Social <laughs> means that there were people on this jury that were kind of Trumpy, and yet they had a unanimous decision in this. And so I do trust the process. I do trust the jury, and it bothers me a lot that that entire process is being called into question because Donald Trump was found guilty of falsifying documents, essentially. And he's already been found guilty of that same thing in a civil trial when it comes to the to his business. So I don't think it's that far of a leap to believe that this is a man who falsifies documents. Um, so I do think it was a fair trial. The process played itself out. As uncomfortable as I am about like him being targeted beforehand, they found him guilty. Like he, he did it. And whether we like the law being on the books or not, like I haven't looked into it. I don't know how weird it is. There was a law. It was broken apparently 34 times. And I think that matters. And so, um, and when it comes to like Trump's sentence, I mean, this is a nonviolent thing. Apparently 90% of the time there's no jail time that has been assigned for, for this 34 particular. felonies, 34 of them, 34 he, felonies that, that should come with, 34 felonies, but Something, again, right? they're all nonviolent. There are fines available. There's probation, which probation isn't exactly a cakewalk. Like you can't travel. You can't associate with other felons. Like this complicates his life in a whole bunch of different ways, even to just be on probation for it. But with Trump, the fact that he defied the judge's orders, I think it was over 10 times. He is showing no remorse whatsoever um, because that's the most disturbing thing for me. If he came out after this verdict and said, you know what? 
I fucked a porn star. I didn't want you guys to find out about it. I didn't want my wife to find out about it. I'm sorry. I paid her off. I did it in a shady way. I shouldn't have done it. But it doesn't matter because this was a target of prosecution. But if he said, I did it, it was stupid, I had my reasons, like... But he's not doing that. He's saying I'm a totally innocent man and that the whole process is rigged. And like this is a man that wants to get empowered to be the chief law enforcement officer in our country. And so to watch him portray himself as totally innocent when we know that he's not, um, that's what's really disturbing to me. And so when I look at like the big picture of how this will affect the election, I don't see this as being a good thing for the ex-president to be a convicted felon. I mean, there's a lot of people that are just not paying very much attention to this and the details of it that are just going to hear convicted felon Donald Trump, and that's going to sway them. I also think there's kind of, like, he paid off a porn star and couldn't even hide it. (laughs) Like, so if you're going to pull this off, like, that's not exactly great management that you couldn't do this with this gang of idiots. And we just keep seeing, like, the people he associates himself with. We have Michael Cohen, who's a liar stole from the company like he doesn't look good this was trump's man for years and then he turned on him that's an ugly look stormy daniels is a disgusting human being i'm sorry she's trash um so he's just got this orbit that we just don't want back in power and so i think we have a lot of low information voters in this country who aren't paying a lot of attention they're going to hear convicted felon and i know that there were studies done now this was before the verdict, but I was listening to the daily and they were talking about studies that they did with people that were likely to vote for Trump who said if he was actually convicted of something that they would not be willing to vote for him. And it wasn't a small percentage of Six the people. Six to 10% that, depending yeah, on which poll. That is not a small amount of people. And so I don't see this as, uh, yes, he raised a lot of money, but that's probably from MAGA faithful. Um, I know. 25% was new they had never donated to Donald Trump or the Republican Party before. Well, I mean, that's depressing that you see a guy get convicted of 34 felonies and go, like, that's my man. I would hope that we're better than that. <laughs> I should have learned my lesson by now. Um, but I I think this is, it's not a clear-cut thing of, like, oh, he's just, he's the victim. He likes to say he's always the victim, but he is actually a criminal, and we also have the other cases that are coming forward too. This is just the first one. This was the dumbest of the it three. It will probably be trials. the well, four trials. Uh, it will probably be the only one that is adjudicated before uh, election day Which because is a of delays. Scandal, yeah. Uh, Heaton, uh, I don't think Jen and I disagree that much in all actuality on this. Jen, Jen I agree with you in terms of the jury and the judge, uh, and I agree with you that Donald Trump is. Uh, is castigating the entire process from beginning to end in a way that is delegitimizing to the court beyond the, the grounds that he should. So like, I think the jury was fine based on everything I've seen. I think the judge was actually really restrained. I'm glad that you brought yeah. up that uh, Trump, vi- Trump violated a gag order. Um, so the, the judge said, look, you're not like, we don't want you trying to influence the jury by trying to create a media firestorm around them for good reason. In the same way that like in a mob case, you're not allowed to like send people to the jury's house. Uh, but, but specifically here, we don't want political pressure on the jury. We want them to be objective. You're not allowed to talk about the case publicly, which he absolutely did. He, he used it as a campaign tenant. I mean, he would walk out of the courtroom and go, this is, this is a rigged system. The judge is corrupt. Like calling a judge corrupt in the trial they're presiding over under any other circumstance would get you probably sent to prison for uh, um, uh, contempt of court. Uh, um, Like he, he, he was contemptuous of the process. So I, I agree with you. He was contemptuous of the process. And in the same way that Trump um, refused to accept the outcome of the 2020 election, he is refusing to uh, accept the outcome of this trial and is therefore trying to delegitimize the entire trial. I agree with you on that and the jury and the judge. Um, I do think that he's got a point when it comes to the prosecutor, and I think that the law itself, as written here, is a very weird funhouse mirror law. And even if a, a judge and jury faithfully execute a bad law, that, that law can be taken to trial itself in a superior court if it violates your constitutional rights. And, and I would say in this process, it seems to me that the, the due process has been violated here because the law, as faithfully executed by a judge and jury, is one that does not allow the defendant to mount a defense on the crime that they've been accused of. That, that's some kind of 
fundamental constitutional rights stuff that I think is legitimate to bring up in, in, in an appeals case. Um, so wh while I'm in agreement, um, the, the trial itself was fine. Um, I, I would acquit it based on those things. Um, if, as far as the 34 counts go, I, I think we've talked about this previously, but I do want to um, uh, clarify that real quick. That was a kind of sleight of hand on behalf of Alvin Bragg, who's the person kind of? the most trouble. Yeah, kind of? So, kind so of? For, for anybody unfamiliar with this or who's forgotten this, what, what Alvin Bragg did was uh, uh, the, the, the crime that Trump is being or has been prosecuted on is that um, instead of writing a non-disclosure agreement to Stormy Daniels, the hush money, a non-disclosure agreement, that was written off as a legal fee. So it was uh, uh, illegally uh, uh, mislabeled on the books, and that is a misdemeanor in the state of New York. Now, there's, there's two problems here. One, the misdemeanor is not really going to knock out Trump, and two, because it's a misdemeanor, the statute of limitations is two years, which means by the time this was brought to trial, the statute of limitations had already passed. That's why Alvin Bragg had to make this a cover-up for an underlying crime because then it's a felony and then he can bring it to court. If he just prosecuted the thing that it was actually prosecuted on, it wouldn't be admissible in court. Uh, but as it is, he, he kind of found this technicality loophole that allows him to not prosecute the underlying crime or even clarify what the crime, crime was or have any Are we anonymity. assuming that was like a campaign finance violation? Is that the underlying? That is, yes. Yeah. Either it's state one of, campaign one of finance three. or federal campaign finance. Yeah. It's, it, it, or tax. Were, Again, they, mm. they never they didn't they didn't specify it in the indictment, nor did they ever clarify it during the trial. And and they they very specifically instructed the jury, you don't have to all you have to say is, do you think a crime happened? You don't have to be in agreement on what the crime was. Um, and so that's happening. And then the other bit is just to kind of beef up the whole thing. Um, there were I don't remember let's say four payments um, given to uh, uh, Cohen in order Michael to Cohen. make. Michael Cohen in order to make this money go away. So what Alvin Bragg did was he went, okay, the writing, labeling this as a legal fee rather than an NDA, that's a crime. Uh, the writing the check is a crime. The sending the check is a crime. And I'm now going to multiply this by every time it happened because it was done in, in monthly payments by 12. And that's how you end up getting 34 counts. So I, I think that nearly anybody would go, really, one crime here happened. And so when, when we get pundits who are kind of breathlessly saying, 34, th this, is, this is a sleight of hand in order to make it seem kind of bigger. Uh, in terms of the... In terms of the, the uh, implication of all this, uh, you, you could be right on that, Jen. I, I mean, like, that's a lot more speculative on my part on, on how this is going to affect the, cam uh, the, 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 the campaign. I, I think it's probably going to supercharge Trump. Um, and I, I say that in part because it already has. I think that it benefited him in the Republican primaries. Um, and I, I think it's made him sympathetic to a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't do it. But that, that's the, I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, and, and it does sound like we, we have a very different interpretation of, of how this will affect it. And I, I'm going to say I'm going to defer to Justin on that one because I feel like he's got a, a, a better sense of putting his finger in the air. Yeah, Jay, what's in your crystal ball? This right now, and we don't know where there's a lot of high, po high quality polls. You really, you really shouldn't pay attention to the polls until... You know, probably two weeks. Five from now. minutes before the election. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, in terms of in terms of stuff like that, I do think that there there is a story to be told in terms of messaging that works or doesn't work. But we don't need to do a whole deep dive. Well, you have to believe polls. that because then you'd be out of a job. <laughs> you have well, to. Well, I, I analyze campaign strategy. <laughs> So, I mean, like, I mean, all right, yeah, all right, anyway, uh, 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 get more slander to my fucking profession. Uh, uh, so, the amount of money that came in should really give pause to the Biden campaign, mm -hmm. because they have not announced their May fundraising numbers. We're going to assume it's a lot less than $140 million uh, last year month the month before that biden raised 50 trump raised 70 there was a cash gap between the two campaigns that is all but erased now trump probably will have a cash on hand lead the republican senatorial committee will be flushed with cash the republican congressional committee will be flushed with cash because of how they've ordered the way that money is coming in right now the note was 290 million to everything that came in literally in may alone that is a staggering amount of money. That is like the amount of money that you used to be able to run an entire presidential campaign on like not too long ago. Yeah. So Such with, a waste. That, with that being said, the reason why that should scare the Democrats and the Biden reelect is that 
especially if you've got 22% of people that have never donated before, if you're donating to a campaign, you're going to vote for them. It's very rare to non-existent that you donate to a campaign and then well, that's, don't. That's why they're, they're big on them. dollar donations, right? When you see yes. people like just just donate a dollar. Like, if like you they're, if you give a dollar, yeah. And so now they have your information, they can contact you to make sure you go vote to, you know, blah 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 blah. Uh I'm more pessimistic on these charges than I think even Heaton is. I think that this these charges were bullshit. I think that these were stupid charges. I think that there's very little that you can actually look at this and say that this was not political from the very jump. I don't disagree with anything that you guys have said, but I am more apt to look at it as fruit of the poison tree. There's a reason why in law enforcement in general, staying away from these kinds of prosecutions during election season is advised. And the reason why is not because you want your elites to never be held accountable, but because... This is a hyperbolic season. The line between decorum in a courtroom and what you are incentivized to do in a political campaign is night and day. Like, yes, you would, you would prefer that there be some kind of civil exchange between the judge and the defendant in any kind of trial. But we're not in any kind of trial. We're in the middle of a presidential campaign where the, the incentive is to gin up the idea that the Republic is falling and that democracy is going to be uh, totally eliminated if you do not vote for me. And by the way, that's now the number one thing that is being said by both candidates in this race is that democracy is on the ballot and you now have to believe which side of it is actually telling the truth and which side of it are indeed the villains that will erode the Republic. But as we know what's going to happen next... Is that the Supreme Court is going to be ruling on the the arguments that Trump lawyers are making to the Supreme Court that as president, he has total immunity. And this is a man who has admitted to nothing, even the stuff like we know he paid off Stormy Daniels. He didn't even admit to having sex with her like they had. They didn't even have to bring that into this trial. And they did because he won't admit doing anything wrong. And I do think that there's people in the middle who are kind of looking at this, who are going to continue to see, okay, he's been convicted by a jury. This is, this. he went through the process. Like his lawyers got to pick jurors. I think there's going to be people that are looking at, he's been convicted. He's arguing he has total immunity. He admits he's done nothing wrong. He's, he is a dangerous person to empower. And when I see that a impartial jury convicted this man, um, you know, I've said a lot of things about Biden. I'm really upset about Biden. I'm pissed off about Gaza. But when I look at Trump's behavior, like I didn't think that anything about this was going to sway me, but I'm watching his behavior right now and going, maybe he is as big a danger as as I felt he was when I found out that he tried to fake the election certifications in seven states. Like I'm starting to be reminded of all that with this conviction and knowing that that the The total immunity thing is campaign. The Biden campaign is 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 counting on you now. I I think that that's. We'll see what the what, what what the Supreme Court ruling is. I would defer to Heaton if he has done any kind of research on but this. But it's not but. the ruling I'm upset. It's the fact that that argument is even being made by those lawyers. That is bizarre to me for any president to say that I have total immunity from the law. That is terrifying. And that's the wide argument he's making. Wide-ranging presidential immunity is not unique to Donald Trump. Total, not, total immunity, that is unique to Donald Trump. That's This is I, unprecedented. I will, I will, uh, I, I, I will defer. I, I do not know the, the full presidential history. All I know is that every president, whenever they've gotten into any kind of scrape, has leaned upon presidential immunity. And then they resign. <laughs> no, one. Like, one. One resigned. Yeah, this is one, this. one resigned. I mean, this is unprecedented. We have to admit that Trump is unprecedented. Trying to fake those seven documents is unprecedented. Okay, okay. Total let's, immunity, let's unprecedented. Not, let's, all right, so this is exactly what the Biden campaign wants. They want this to be the gateway into, I'm just saying, It just happens to be true. Strategically. Good. The White House is cheering. They're popping bottles. They've converted Jen Briney. Uh, uh, this is this is what they want. Now, I'm saying strategically. What the Republicans want, what Donald, what Donald Trump wants, is for Susan Collins and Mitt Romney to say this was a political persecution, and now they are closer together with the Trump campaign than anybody could have ever imagined. And what they want is for that 47% of the electorate that would consider themselves Republican, they want all that Pangea to reunite 
into one solid voting block. And then at that point, they can win this election based on the economy where he has like a 20% lead over Joe Biden. That's the, those are the two strategic things. That's the reason why they want convicted, fel- the Democrats, sorry, the White House wants convicted felon to be the official first name of Donald Trump. And that any time that you say his name, you should say convicted felon Donald Trump. And that Donald Trump wants political prisoner Donald Trump to be the prefix of his name forever. And I do think that it's going to be very interesting to see what 34 felonies earns you in the eyes of the judge. Because if it's parole or or house arrest or jail to a large portion of America, he's going to be white Mandela. He is going to be a political prisoner. That's but that if you believe that that's ridiculous. It's just it's simply ridiculous. And I think that, you know, it doesn't make me a White House spokesperson to say that, like, this guy sees himself as above the law. And when the law actually is applied to him, he claims that he's innocent and that he's a victim every single time. I think you were both right. I, I, I agree, Jen. I think he believes he is above the law. And I think he has a lifelong track record of flouting the law of being sued for fraud, of being sued for failing basic financial obligations. I think it's somewhat telling that the vast majority of his previous uh, staff has not endorsed him. Um, and uh, and on top of that, like I, I think he is pathologically incapable of understanding that he can do wrong. Uh, he And it, it's at the very least, he's pathologically incapable of admitting to being wrong. Um, 2020, I, I think he thinks he won the election. And I, I think he, he therefore thought, I cannot lose the election. So whatever means I do to uh, arrive at a pro-Trump outcome is justified. Uh, and that, that bit was, that's to me, the worst thing he ever did was um, tried to go, tried to cherry pick blue counties in swing states and have judges throw out the county, not do a recount, which would have been permissible, but throw it out, right? And I think you're seeing the exact same thing happen in this court trial. I'm glad you brought up the Stormy Daniels thing, Jen. Um, This is something uh, I I talked to uh, Paul Townsend, my defense attorney, uh, when I'm in New York uh, about this, and he he disagrees with me on this, and he certainly knows more than I do. But I I looked at the Trump, or excuse me, the Trump defense and went, this is a very, like, odd position to put the defense team on where they can't even admit that he banged Stormy Daniels. Like, at no point during the trial did they admit that. Uh, because that would have been, a, I, I think, a stronger argument. Would have been like, um, they would have been able to contest the whole hush money thing if they'd said, um, you know what, uh, uh, Donald Trump really loves his wife and he screwed up and he had an affair and he didn't want her to find out and so he tried to quietly make this go away in order to preserve his marriage. Because if you can buy that, then you're not influencing the campaign, you're influencing yeah. your marriage, and it's very difficult to prosecute but, based but, on but, intentionality. But, 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 but you still have the tax law. You still have, and again, when you don't have to agree on what the underlying crime is, then you can still say he didn't, well, he, he didn't write down is, NDA, he wrote down lawyer. It's, it's and, the and, and inability so to, to, to say he did something wrong. Well, and, and just, we just, swing, just swing back. So I, I'm, I'm in agreement in terms of the assessment of Donald Trump. I completely agree with Jen. In yeah. terms of the assessment of his character and the danger that he, he uh, supposes to the republic, I, I don't disagree with you. Uh, Justin, where I agree with you is this trial in particular. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I was reading about and that I've seen kind of floating around in the media around this trial is Al Capone. Um, so what, one of the, good, one of the mm-hmm. good podcasts that covers trials, m- most jurisdictional media is terrible. Most of the news that you see <laughs> about court trials are fucking unconscionably bad. Most of it is. Uh, lawfare is pretty good. I like Lawfare. What, what, I've, what I've heard from Lawfare, it's another podcast. I think that they're a very, very intelligent group of people that respects their audience. Um, I like and them. Yeah, I like Lawfare. Uh, I think they're good people. Um, Roger Parloff, who's one of the voices on that, um, kind of shared my inclinations at the beginning of all of this, where he was looking at the court case and he went... This is not a strong case. This is not the thing to come after Trump on. And then he did an about face towards the end. I, I don't know the full Roger Parloff arc, by the way, but it, towards the end of the trial, he wrote an op-ed where he's like, this is basically Al Capone. And he went, uh, Donald, uh, Don, Donald Trump has a lifelong uh, habit of flouting the law, and you're going to have to get him on a technicality. And this is Al Capone type stuff. We just need to get him on, on tax evasion. And my, my problem with that analysis, which I also want to clarify is not anything Jen said this episode, uh, but that I'm seeing with other pundits, is twofold. One, uh, 
Al Capone did actually evade taxes. Like it was an actual <laughs> law that he broke <laughs> that he was prosecuted on. So like he he was justified in being prosecuted on that. But but more to the point, the the, the foundations of American jurisprudence are that you are innocent until proven guilty, and that a prosecutor doesn't decide you're guilty and then go looking for the crime, because those are one and the same thing. When, when, when the prosecutor goes, look, we all know he's a guilty piece of shit. We'll, we'll, we'll throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks at the end. That is countervened to the, entol- the entire jurisprudential model of the United States. And I think we saw that in this particular case. And I think where Alvin Bragg colossally misstepped, not just in terms of the electoral elements, but in terms of the uh, the, the judicial side of this is that Alvin Bragg looked at a guy like Donald Trump, and he went, this guy f- poses uh, a, a serious threat to law and order in the United States, which I agree with. And his response to that was, so I'm going to kind of just get him. I'm just going to get him. And that was the misstep. The misstep there was, look, if, for those of us that believe in law and order, and I'm very much in that camp, we can't respond to people that flout law and order by trying to flout it ourselves to get them. Un- unfortunately, if, if we're the law and order people, we have to apply the law and order even to the people breaking it. And I think that this is an example where that went out of whack with Alvin Bragg. I, 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 I worry. I also worry about where we're going from here. Because if this is the case and we're going to agree that this guy deserved to get it, then what is to stop let's say through Me Too, there was a lot of judicial reform that happened with sexual assault and removing statutes of limitations so you could prosecute sexual assaults uh, later than you would otherwise to bring justice to women that had uh, had a befall on them. So let's say that there's an attorney general or some county prosecutor in Arkansas that there's a woman named Juanita Broderick who for decades has said that Bill Clinton raped her. And now Bill Clinton is brought in front of a blood red jury in Arkansas to face rape charges. Fine by me. I mean, I, I would be uncomfortable with that process. I would be uncomfortable with the idea that we are hunting uh, political figures for prosecution and finding venues that are favorable to that. Uh, And, and I think it, yes, it does bring a element of justice to uh, uh, the the minds of people who believe that politicians have gotten away with too much for too long. And I'm sympathetic to that, but I don't think it leads our Republic in a good place. I don't think that it brings us uh, anywhere closer to actual law and order. I think it, it busies the dockets and it busies prosecutors for looking for marquee cases and it doesn't do much for the average citizen. And I think that that's, that's where we should be. I mean, if Bill Clinton has been credibly accused of rape, there's a rape victim out there that never got justice. And so even if he's 90 years old and gets prosecuted for that, fine by me. Um, George W. Bush started a war based on lies and tortured people. If he ends up in prison for that, fine by me. Barack Obama decided to drone bomb an American citizen and never got prosecuted for that. Fine by me. Like, I'm actually okay with every single one of them ending up behind bars because that would show that if you get a position of power, you're not above the law. And we are now in a position where we have a former president who is running for president and is neck and neck with the dude we currently have who is at the Supreme Court saying, I have total immunity from the law. That's where, that's, I think, the bigger he threat had to when he was president. But he wants to be president again and might very well be president again at the beginning of next year. So this is a current threat. This is a man who believes he's above the law. And so I am more concerned about the elites in this country not only thinking they are above the law, but being proven so in so many cases. We have so many former presidents that have been credibly accused of crimes and they have not been prosecuted for it. So if there are prosecutions that happen now, fine by me. So you are fine with with, uh, politically motivated prosecutions yep okay. if it serves justice to the people because if well, i there's raped, a big if if that's if, a big if if one of you guys raped someone you would probably go to prison for it and deservedly so and i think that that should apply to bill clinton and donald trump he's also accused of raping a whole bunch of people like these people who are rich and powerful getting away with so many crimes just because the other political party is the one that says hey prosecute this guy for the crime if the crime exists and the jury says yes it did and that jury was fairly picked Lock them up. I think Lock them up. Do you want to indulge in the hypothetical that we've raped people? I do not. Uh, I think we're talking about three different things here, though. Uh, Jen, I agree with you 
on justice be done, that no one is above the law, including former presidents, that we, we I, I'm, I'm very much in agreement that, um, you know, if you manage to get to the highest office, we don't just excuse crimes that you did because we don't want to make ripples. I think that that's different than um, politically motivated, where we go, uh, we're Republicans, let's haul up uh, uh, Bill Clinton to score points. So I, I think that you and Justin are actually kind of talking about different things. And then I would add the thing that I'm kind of, bo- that I'm most bothered by all of this is, um, show me the guilty man and I'll come up with a crime, which I feel like is a different thing as well. Um, so Yeah, that's spe- a different thing. But if it's politically motivated that it's Republicans who are choosing to prosecute a possible rapist because the Democrats politically chose not to, like I don't, you can call it politically motivated, but if there's a rape there, I don't really give a shit who starts the trial. The trial should happen. And if it, well, if a rape that person accusation. Is, yes, but like if it happens, if we have a, Incredibly, if we have a rapist who got to the highest levels of power in the world and got away with it, I don't think that's a good thing. And if it's the Republicans that end up prosecuting that for whatever reason, if there was a rape, I don't care. Because it's also a politically motivated thing to not prosecute. Like, those are both active decisions. And so I'm, I'm less worried about that than I am people being above the law in the United States. And in my entire lifetime, I've just witnessed more and more lawlessness to the point that I think it's gotten to be obscene. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not so afraid of that point taken that we should, everybody should be held accountable. Um, let's, let's get away from the rape uh, thing for a second. Like what about Rico law? Cause this is another example to me of novel legal theory being used to grab a person. So like, I don't like Rico law to begin with kind of same way that I don't like this particular law in New York. I think it's a poorly crafted law. Rico law strikes me as something that basically presumes guilt by association, uh, which is again, it seems antithetical to the American sense of justice, uh, where with, with Rico law, quick primer, um, you are, uh, you were being charged with being a part of a criminal syndicate, and therefore you can be held accountable to things that the criminal syndicate does. Uh, it was bas- basically invented because they're like, let's stop trying to get Al Capone on tax evasion. Yes. Let's prosecute mob bosses by rolling up all the murders and extortions yeah. that get done by people below them and then have them flip one by one to prove that there is a criminal conspiracy yeah. for which the person at the top who doesn't get their hands dirty directly will be charged. Sounds I, good to me. So <laughs> tough on crime, Jen the person, Briney. But the Lock them up, Jen Briney. The person that orders the go. murders deserves to be punished sure, for it. Sure, if mm-hmm. if proven. But 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 what Rico law is not about saying um, we can prove Al Capone gave the hit on the Saint Valentine's Day massacre. That would be totally fine. Um, what what Rico law says is we don't actually know who did it. We don't know. We don't know where the chain of command is. We can't prove that this person did this crime. What we can prove is they were associating with these people, and we're gonna we're going to uh, we're going to prosecute them as a group. We can prove membership in the thing. Therefore, so that that to me is uh, too associative. The thing that I, that I'm worried about in that kind of thing, to get back to Justin's example I, I, again, Jen, I completely agree with you that like the statute of limitations on political figures should not expire, justice should be done, people should not be shielded based, I, I'm in agreement with you. The, the stuff that I'm worried about is lawfare, of, of um, rather than just let's hold everybody accountable, let's figure out how to weaponize the law in order to achieve a political end. That's the thing I'm more worried about. So like with, with the RICO case with Trump, RICO law already makes me uncomfortable. With, with Trump, I'm looking at that going like, what if the Republicans take this and run with it, which they will. Like, I, I think that the, the Republicans don't tend to be particularly creative when it comes up to this kind of stuff, but man, they're fucking good at supercharging it. They got really fucking good at gerrymandering, and uh, they're, they're now leading the pack on that. And I, I worry that with, like, trying to get Trump taken out on RICO law for racketeering charges in Georgia. That this is, this is the some, Georgia case, yeah. Yeah, you're going to see some weird shit where, like, the Republicans go after, like, Gavin Newsom because somebody in his campaign did something wrong, and it's still the Newsom campaign, so he's the one that ought to go to jail. Like, I'm, I'm worried that, that this is going to turn into lawfare moving forward. I just don't worry so much about Slippery Slope. When it comes to that Georgia case, the Georgia case is about Donald Trump and a group of people that were working on his behalf trying to fake the election cer- certification to say he won when he didn't. And is there a piece of paper where Donald Trump wrote down and said, Kenneth Cheese, bro, you do this. And, you know, Giuliani, you do this. Like, no, there, there was a conspiracy there. 
And if this is the law that we currently have that can say, okay, this group worked together, they each played their roles, but this was the goal. The goal itself was a crime. If that is how they choose to prosecute it, I do trust that they will find 12 jurors that can look at the whole thing and say, did this happen? Was this fair? So I'm taking that case for what it is. And if it's RICO law that is going to be the way that you can say that this group acted together to accomplish this illegal goal, I'm fine with it. This is like, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. None of us are here are lawyers. I do trust that these prosecutors, they have to go by the actual law. This is why the defendants get their own lawyers to make the case that you're making. I think we take it case by case and we don't not prosecute this because we're afraid of future Republicans. Like there was a crime committed there. There's no way that's not a crime. And just because I mean, Donald there's, Trump... There's an argument that it's a novel legal theory that John F. Kennedy applied in 1960. They they faked election certifications to the point of having people hide it was inside an alternate, buildings. an alternate slate of electors. Yeah. The way that John Kennedy did in 1960. John Kennedy did not do he what did Trump did. in Hawaii. Oh my God. This that's is the not argument. The same. But that's my point: is that there is a legal argument, and and that's that's where look the RICO law thing. Why we the have federal courts. the federal J six case, I think, is the most damaging to Trump. I think that that you could, and again, it less on a, a legal question for which I don't have the bona fides to answer. I don't think any of us have the bona fides to answer. Of where does that argument of novel legal theory end, and where does a crime begin? That is something that that I think will be left there. I think the Mar-a-Lago docs case is even more problematic for Trump because his greatest argument is. Either I have an immunity to do X, Y, or Z, or nobody was enforcing the rules. Why do I get punished because uh, you know for the rules that nobody else was being enforced by? It also would have That's, been a Florida jury, which would have been a, a lot more easy for people to stomach. I think just in terms of implications, if it had gone. But but that that, that I do think I do think that is a more problematic case, especially for some of these voters. If we're going to switch it back to the election side, the RICO case I think is over broad. I, I don't believe that Fonnie Willis is credible in bringing RICO cases because I don't think that the RICO case she brought against Young Thug, which is currently being prosecuted, is either uh, well done or well applied. And and we can giggle about it, but I do think that that's a it's, it's a problematic application of an overbroad law that I agree with Heaton is if you can define a criminal syndicate in an organization, which I would say that the Young Thug situation is closer to because at least it's a, you know, there are elements of a street gang involved in this. It, we have to believe that that uh, a Young Thug was the person ordering these hits, which I think is a stretch, uh, especially to use his lyrics as a reason to say that he was uh, confessing to do it. With the, the Trump campaign or the Trump case, you don't even have a campaign to run on. This was an organization that was essentially put together on the fly by people that didn't know each other. Yeah. So it's harder for me to say in the statute that you need to prove for a RICO case that there is a solid group that knew where they were taking orders from and knew what they were doing. That's what a RICO case is for, is to prosecute mob bosses. Uh, that is a, a thing that is... Too far from under me. racketeering specifically, yes. as in as in uh, multiple habitual crimes done for profit by a criminal syndicate. I, I yes. Jen, again, I agree with you on the fraud thing. Um, there, there were fraudulent electors who who committed fraud because they said not just I am the rightful elector that like I think Donald Trump truly won the election, but said I have been certified, which is a demonstrably illegal thing to do because certification means I am I am claiming that the state of Georgia and the Secretary of State have affirmed that, which was not true. They committed fraud, and they should be in prison. They, but they should be prosecuted based on fraud. And they but are it's, being it's, prosecuted. Great, and, and, that's, and, and they should go to prison for that. It's the racketeering bit that I have a problem, because racketeering is this weird way to get there of uh, it, it's, it's a criminal syndicate that committed racketeering charges. And I'm like, well, that's, I don't think that's what happened. Like, and, and then but that, we that haven't gets in, seen the trial yet. So it's like having, watched, having watched 20 hours of that January 6th committee, like, I know that there were different pieces that actually were working together. And I have to imagine that after all this time, Fonnie Willis has collected even more information. And so I think that it's it's too early to judge what she has there. But this is one of those cases where if you are putting people behind bars for signing those documents, but the person they were signing them for is not held accountable, that's a problem. And if RICO law is what connects them, like... Okay. I, I, I would say figure out a way to apply a fraud to him, which I think is fine. I think it would be it would be crazy to me to think that there was an entire slate of fake electors and none of them thought to contact Donald Trump. 
to yeah. say, by the way, I, and I, and th- this is a very appealing legal argument to me. I, I, but but like, just just so you understand where I'm coming from, the thing that that bothers me is just a we've determined the guy is guilty. Now we're going to figure out the crime to get apply him. to him, derive it. That, that's get him no matter what abrogates due process, and that's the thing I'm worried about. Yeah, and I think that in the Lock Stormy Daniel thing, lock him up. <laughs> I think in this Stormy Daniels thing, that's a legit fear because, like you said, and we all know, this DA ran on getting one particular person. I think the trying to remain president when you lost thing is a completely different situation. Yeah. And I think the biggest scandal is that that happened three and a half years ago and we still haven't had that trial before the election. Like that is Whose insane is that? to me. I, how the fuck would I know? I would say the people bringing the case. And part of the reason why you're seeing the kind of political movement that you are is that these are cases that are all popping up very close to the but election. These are as opposed endless to- delays that are being caused by Trump's lawyers. Like the reason that the, because the January 6th stuff, there's two cases. There's Georgia and then there's Jack Smith who's also doing yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Through the Jack Federal. Smith thing, former President Donald Trump says, well, I'm immune to anything I did while president. And so that's going all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not rushing that decision or even that hearing that case even though they know this election is coming up, the Supreme Court say, could say these are, ex, you know, extremely different circumstances from anything we've ever seen. And they could hurry the fuck up. And they didn't choose to do that either. So there is a slow rolling of this that I don't think can be just blamed upon Fonnie Willis and Jack Smith. Like this delay tactic of the Trump lawyers, it's working. And I think it's just another case of like this guy is getting away with crimes by just slowing down justice, too. So if Stormy Dan, if this is how we prove that he's a felon the first time, at least this one happened before the election. Get him no matter what. Not get him no matter yeah, what. Yeah, but... blood in the water. <sighs> I don't know what to do with you, Justin. <laughs> I think it's very telling that every time that we start talking about this case, we wind up talking about other cases. Yeah, because, because the other I think ones it, are stronger. I think, it, I think it shows that this one is not that strong, and I think that's part of the reason why you've seen the reaction that you've seen, Yeah, is that I, this was again, not a strong I, case. I, as somebody that doesn't like Trump, that doesn't want Trump to be president, I'm infuriated with Alvin Bragg. I, I think that this was a really bad move, and I think that there were other stronger things to pursue Trump on, and this, is, this isn't one of them. And it was the kickoff, and it's going to suck all the oxygen out of the room, and it's going to taint all of the other trials as politically motivated now. If, but, if they put him in jail... Which, Mitt Romney's going to put a red hat which on. Which they won't. I'm telling you. They won't. They can't because they can't put him in jail before Wait, the why, appeal. Wait, why is that? 34 Timeline. felonies. Timeline. 34 felonies. They can't put him in jail before he gets his appeal, and that won't happen before the election. So he won't go to jail before the election. That's not... I think it's, it's very unlikely. I'm, I'm not sure that It's possible. I don't know That's that the sentencing now. has to be postponed till after appeal. I'm not sure how that works in state law. I, th- I think they can the just The sentencing is going to be a few days before the convention, so yeah. there will be a July sentencing. 11th. Yeah. But that sentencing doesn't go into effect until the appeals are exhausted. Okay. So... They're not uh, going right. to lock him up on July 11th. Like that's. It's I, just I, I also just get, given how restrained Judge Merchant was throughout that entire process. Again, laudably so, given that uh, the the defendant was literally going outside saying it's a crooked judge, which would absolutely get you locked up in any other courtroom. I I I I'm in agreement with Jen. I don't think Judge uh, that, that Trump's going to serve any jail time um, uh, under normal circumstances. Doesn't that something- seem weird? 34 felonies, no jail time. Doesn't that seem like a, like a, like a cognitive dissonance? No, no it, it doesn't. No? Because it's a, no. It's a first-time no? offender. It's a first-time offender in a nonviolent crime. It would be very common mm. in a New York state court to not give jail time for this, to have probation. But when you, all right, so, so. According I, I, to the I, New York Times, legally, in the exact, hold on. According to the New York Times, in the exact same circumstances, only 10% of people serve prison time. So no, this isn't crazy. Okay, all right. Well, then let me just, again, let me, let me take it down to my bumpkin level uh, uh, of, of political messaging. Normally, when you say the phrase 34 felonies, what do you think the average sentence that you would think people would say would be? A lot. <laughs> a lot. A, a lot fucking of lot. Time. Yeah. A lot of jail A time. lot of money and a lot of jail so, time. So when it's less than that, I think there's going to be a political argument made, and we'll see how much the American people uh, buy it, that this was a press release. This was done. This was an in-kind donation to Joe Biden's re-election campaign. Oh, for Christ's So his sake. political... Uh, enemy could be labeled a 34 count felon. There was there were 12 jurors that said he was guilty. 
this isn't a polit- not everything is related to the campaign. There was a whole trial that happened. This isn't just a favor to the Biden. Like this yeah, isn't I'll, even a federal trial. Ex- thank you. I was, I was about to say this, this. This is something that Trump has said. From there the was a member of the Biden Department of Justice that joined the prosecution team. This stop it. What? He was like Can number three at DOJ. Wait, because this is something that I thought that, that, again, Trump overstepped on, where Trump would repeatedly say, this is the Biden Justice Department coming after yeah, me. And I would look at that and go, this is, a, this is a state trial. It doesn't have anything there was, to do with the There government. was somebody that left the, the Justice Department and joined Alvin Bragg's office, and he was up on stage when they were announcing, and when they were doing the press conference. He was like to the left or right, depending on what the camera is, of uh, of Alvin Bragg. Now, how that happens, whether or not this was Joe Biden saying, take care of it, or uh, it's just a guy who left one job and went to another job. Uh, I don't know. But if Joe Biden I, was some kind of wizard making all these things happen for his campaign, his son would not be in court today yeah. on charges. Which also, we will if, talk if, about if, in if, our Patreon episode. If Joe Biden <laughs> were some kind of wizard, this is not the fucking thing that you'd, like. again, like, like I don't want Trump to win. And and I think yeah. this was a colossal misstep. If I were Biden, I would have been like, please calm the fuck down, Alvin Bragg, star child, who is the anointed of the, the New York legal system, who's going to use this to pull vault your career. Hold the fuck back, because this is not going to be advantageous. I, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think Biden had anything to do with this. If he did, why wouldn't he have had Merrick Garland fucking do it? Why wouldn't it have been through the justice? Like Merrick Garland declined to do this. And so it went to a harder to prove trial at a state level. I, yeah, I I don't think any of that. Um, I I think uh, probably he doesn't serve jail time. Although to be frank, uh, again, in a situation like this where you're a nonviolent offender that uh, wouldn't get jail time, if you've been held in uh, contempt of court multiple times, you might fucking get jail time. So it's possible. But I think that the most likely outcome if this happened is the very, very, very weird situation where Trump would be given deferred time till after he's president in the event that he's elected president. So you could have this very odd situation where he is theoretically supposed to come to New York State under his own reconnaissance the day after he steps down. You are looking at some very bizarre situations, but I, I don't think he'll have I, jail time. Yeah. Or a president of the United States who's not allowed to associate with other felons or travel. <laughs> like, yeah. How the fuck is that going to work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, politically, I do think that they martyred him. Oh, okay. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. If if he's if he's in jail, we're going to see red armbands at yeah. the D, at, at the RNC. It's going to it's it's going to be like it, there, he's going to have his own ribbon. It's it's going to be a cause beyond politics. I mean, this I, is a good segue into like going into the Libertarian Convention because we saw these MAGA people. They're already, you know, worshiping the, the man. The, so it's the, like, the, the, oh, uh, they're going to have armbands now. Like, okay, let's just no, add a different like thing Susan to the Collins. costume. I'm saying like Susan Collins and Mitt Romney. Like no. those those were the people. I'm telling you. Okay. Based on what they said on Thursday, they are not sympathetic. Well, and, and, and then again, I'd also put in line. like like the, the like if. I, my guess is there's some amount of Trump supporters who are in California, who are in New York State, who are in, um, I, I, I'm trying to think of other, Vermont or whatever, that under normal circumstances would rationally say, my vote is not going to make a difference because I know that the state's going to vote blue, so I'm just not going to bother voting, but I'll, I'll own the red hat or whatever. I think those people are going to come out in droves. That, that's why I think he's going to win the popular vote, even if he doesn't win the electoral college. Uh, but And, and I granted, think it's the exact opposite. Yeah. I think those people will just stay home and be like, okay, he's a felon, he's gross, he's... I think there's going to be people that just... Okay, he's actually a convicted felon now. He's he's a this, dangerous person. So, so th- this is a really good segue th- to get into the libertarian one, and I'll kick it to Justin in a second. Well, since no, hold the, on. Patreon.com yeah. slash where not wrong is uh, <laughs> where you go to support this show. This uh, You get a bonus episode, and uh, we are going to be talking more about the legal system, this time about Hunter Biden. He, too, is on trial and saying that it is unfair and politically motivated. Is he right? We will talk about that in our Patreon. Uh, the Libertarian Party. Heaton, what were you about to say? Um, I know a lot of Libertarians. I hear from a lot of Libertarians. And I'm hearing from a lot of them that previously, um, this is post-convention. Uh, I don't, they didn't, that didn't seem to change anything for them. But I'm hearing from um, several of them that previously were a, a pox on both your houses. The Republicans are just red-flavored authoritarians. The, uh, the Democrats are just blue-favored authoritarians. I'm going to vote libertarian if it's libertarian enough. I'm hearing from a lot of that crowd that's going, 
uh, Trump got railroaded. This is lawfare. I am voting against the Democrats to send a clear message that they can't win elections that way. So I do think that there's going to be a, de a decent amount of libertarians that otherwise might have gone third party or not voted that will vote for Trump. Now, granted, they're not a huge amount of the electorate, so maybe it won't be a giant, but I'm at least seeing that in some of my circles. And you know what? That does make sense to me because one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about this is that since we got back from the convention, the headline has been Trump got booed. And like, yes, when he made fun of the libertarians to their faces, which I have to admit made me belly lap multiple times because it was actually so three <laughs> percent, so which funny. is also a double a double disc because they normally get one. <laughs> Yeah, so it was, it was actually was really so fun. Rude. It was a really fun rally event. Like the three of us were laughing pretty much the whole time. We had a good time. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, but there were also times where everyone was cheering. So this whole line of like Trump got booed. Like, am I insane, or were there some definite moments of like unity that I was feeling in that room? I, can I, I give you my interpretation of this? And I think you, I'm unity. A I think I think here. would be a stretch. I, I, I think I don't I'm, know. I'm the, there were some standing ovations. I, I've I've got the most libertarian anthropo anthropologist uh, credentials. Uh, uh, so yeah. my, my my read on that room was about 40% of the people in the room, 30 to 40% were MAGA people that had nothing to do with the convention, that just saw that Trump was doing it and they came in. So those, those were the people that came in, sat at the front, then got pushed to the back. <laughs> and we're all we're very mad about by it. The way, by the way, you <laughs> knew them immediately, A, because they come in uniform, but also there's a very specific strain of Trump rally people that are either elderly or like barely 18 18 like yeah. they're like teenagers 19 like, with coiffed hair and suits yes and like, suits, like there's a very right? specific youth, young republican demographic which at least uh, they've got uh, good costume i'll give them that they're but, but and that, very but that, pretty girls uh but yeah. that is usually where the the trump people were the libertarians were be nice. Ab just barbarians at the game. Right. I, I have never <laughs> seen. Is, I like, like, like just just for people to understand the the vibe of what that was. I've never seen a double goon hand of hotel bar drinks where the dude had like the four pack of drinks from the bar in one hand, fingers in the glass, uh, and then another goon hand with another four. That was the most drunk political event. Like if we're talking about AAA, this is big talent there, political events, they're usually pretty managed. The Trump campaigns are the ones that are a little bit wilder. None were as drunk as what we saw. There, also there was a lot drinks, of drinks, dead time. That was um, free drinks. I, I'm pretty. I, I don't think I paid for the. Oh, song. you missed I out. Was a cash <laughs> I got, yeah, I got, I got Jen and I diet cokes. I think they had free drinks. To to, to finish my pie chart here. So sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you're fine. Forty percent MAGA. Uh, I'd say about ten percent of the people in the room were anti-Trump or anti-red team and blue team or whatever. But they they weren't budging. And then I'd say the rest, about fifty percent of the people in the room were just very vocal about whatever Trump was saying. So if, if Trump went, um, you know, with the American military is great, like they would all like, boo! But then if yeah. it was like, maybe we'll get rid of the Fed, they'd be like, yay! So they were just yeah. very vocal yeah. in whatever he said. It wasn't that they were opposed to or in favor of Trump in that moment. They were just going to be very loud about whatever it was he said, whether they liked it or disliked it. So well, they did I mean, boo him, I, but they also, they also cheered him, depending on the thing. They cheered him, too, because there were policies there that everyone in that room agreed upon. And so I just kind of was fascinated by the fact, like, I was in that room. And had I been reporting on this, I would have said that there were boos, but there were also clear moments of political unity between the, Republic, the Republican nominee and these libertarians. Like, when he said his anti-war stuff, everybody cheered. Yeah. So, like... Um, and and the, he said he, he didn't say anything. He said something about the vaccine, and I can't remember exactly what it was. And I remember thinking, well, that's a fucking lie. But like he said something about you know he wouldn't do vaccine mandates, even though he did Operation Warp Speed. But like got cheers still. But he was saying like he's anti-vaccine in some way, and like. Mm. Um, but everybody cheered. So it was just, I saw, I would have said that there were moments of political unity and that wasn't really reported anywhere. So it was fascinating to me to be like, I experienced this and the reality of what was reported sounded false to me. I've, I had, I've got a little cadre of various different reporters and people and guests that have been on the show. And one of them is huge. Never Trumper, like absolute. Never, ever, ever will he come anywhere near voting for Donald Trump. 
And he was texting me while we were in the room. He's watching it on C-SPAN or whatever. And he's like, oh, my God, what a disaster. What a disaster. And he's, like, sending me these uh, uh, things on threads uh, uh, of, of, like, Trump booed, uh, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, look, this is a drunk crowd. Yeah. This is a really rowdy, wild this, crowd. This is a Lucha Libre mask with yes. flags. But also, like... This is the libertarian love language. Like, like them booing, they, they do that to each other. They do that to the people they love. They do that to their own nominees. Like, we, we, we eventually, we can fast forward to Heaton's experience the next night where they took 16 <laughs> hours to almost decide that they weren't going to have a candidate this year. Yeah. Uh, but but Didn't have to that dance, is by not the way. Didn't outside of the realm. You didn't, 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 but you looked so sharp for no reason. <laughs> uh, thank you. So did you get down? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> it was like a white tuxedo, right? It was. Uh, From uh, I'm still, we will get to it because I still fits. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I want to. I want to get to your experience the next night. But Jen, did you get a chance to go down to the floor to the to the libertarian, the actual uh, place where they were hammering out their? policy and deciding like who their chair and who their nominee was going to be no because when i got there i just assumed all of that was going to happen in the same room as trump oh. so i went through the secret service thing and that's when i was texting you guys like you need to get here because weirdos are coming over to me <laughs> yeah i think that was that was a shame we were hanging out down there they were trying to elect their chair uh they were taking too long uh with all that which is another thing that I think got lost in some of the conversation around this is that like, oh, the MAGA people, they they got more of their people up front and it was like some no. uh, uh, cloak and dagger kind of thing. No. Here's I can a- explain this because I was in the room. Please, go ahead. So when I went in, they were only allowing journalists in first and so I was in that line. And so by the way, if any libertarians are listening to this and I say like weirdos were coming after me, it was another journalist. It was none of you. <laughs> Every single person I met at that convention was absolutely lovely. I love that they care so much. Like I, Every single libertarian was great. This one journalist wouldn't leave me the fuck alone. So <laughs> that's who I'm talking about. Um, but we walk in and I asked, I said, is there anywhere as press that I'm not allowed to go? And the guy was like, no, sit wherever you want. And so there was a bunch of circle tables that were up in the front. And so journalists with their computers and shit went and sat at the tables because no one was telling us not to. And I did walk um, to the side. I didn't like walk all of them because I didn't know that I had to like research this. But there was nothing on it indicating that you couldn't sit there. And so now you explain why this matters because you know so- better. <laughs> The libertarians had been told, and this was part of the idea of why this was not an act of political cuckoldry, as I said on this show and many others. Although I was happy to hear that somebody on the libertarian floor called a motion to order saying that this was a a political cuckoldry. So whoever that libertarian delegate is, I hope you got it from us. And I'm glad that you said it out loud. Uh, The promise was oh, we're going to embarrass Donald Trump. And the reason why is because all the libertarian delegates are going to get the closest seats. Now, as Jen pointed out, first it was the journalists. We all had to be cleared on Secret Service before 5 o'clock because we are allowed to bring in stuff that other people are not, equipment that we would use to do our jobs, bags and stuff, cameras. Uh, But the libertarians were all in the literal basement yelling at each other (laughs) about who the chair was going to be, and that went later than it was supposed to on the schedule. So while they're arguing with each other, all the MAGA people in their nice little red dresses and their blue uh, And their literal jackets, Trump costumes. And their literal Trump costumes were all very politely waited uh, uh, at the line before anybody else could get in because that's what Trump people do for Trump rallies. They wait very, very long amount of time so they can get good seats. So they wind up getting in. The only reason why that was a problem is because there was no signage that this was delegate-only seating, and there was no member of the Libertarian Party there to say, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, uh, Please, you can sit here, you can sit here at these signed things, but these are reserved for delegates. The only person who was directing traffic was the Trump director for... Secret Service was letting people in. Mm. They're not. They don't care about who they sits where. They don't give a where. shit. Yeah. They don't give a shit. So they're mostly concerned pass... with nobody dying. That's their main yes. priority. Mm-hmm. That's all they care about. The only person who was doing any kind of like, and I mean this credibly for the event, crowd control in any way was Trump's director for Virginia. She was that that the... nice lady that we talked she to? She was the lady yeah. we talked to, and she's like, yeah. 
They called me yesterday. <laughs> The, the, the Trump campaign, they said, can you be in D.C. tomorrow? And I'm like, well, I'm glad I didn't have any Memorial Day plans. Yeah. So she was helping yeah. put stuff together. And it's only once the libertarians are done screaming at each other in the basement and uh, 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 Angela McArdle is reelected that she has to come up and say, so, guys, pretty please. <laughs> can we have you move four rows back? Because yeah. we've promised our delegates that that's going to be there. That was all that happened was was just disorganization from the Libertarian Party because they were over schedule yelling at each other. And had their convention compartmentalized like that? Because I figured like I got there at four. Trump was speaking at eight. I was expecting to hear stuff that whole time. And most of it. Like the so this is why I wanted to talk about this, too, Andrew, because you need to explain to me what the fuck happened. But they had picked a nominee. We heard from that guy. He gave one of the weirdest, shortest speeches I've ever <laughs> they, heard in my entire life. They didn't. Yeah. But well, but yeah. he was billed as the nominee. Uh, so he gives a weird speech. Dave Smith gets up there and brings the house down like he yeah. owns that party. It is crystal clear. I love Dave Smith. Thank you for introducing me to him. I love yeah. him. But he brings the house down. And then we just fucking sat there listening to nothing for hours until Trump spoke. No, and it Mike was like Lee. Mike Lee came up. Yeah, they ha oh yeah, Mike Lee came up, but they had all this opportunity to be doing convention things where the people were, and they didn't. And then the next day, Andrew, this is what I need you to explain to me because I got out of dodge. Um, the weird guy, Michael Rechtenwald. Rechtenwald, mm -hmm. who's apparently you have, on I'm, edibles. I'm sure real quick, Jen. When we're at a libertarian convention, you can't say the weird guy. Yeah, come you on, have to, okay, you have to be. That is a broad <laughs> statement, right? That's like being in England and going the guy with a funny tooth. You know who I'm talking about? That guy? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Rechtenwald, who I only call weird because his speech was so odd. Right. Um, I find out via text from you that he was on edibles, and then the uh -huh. next day they replaced the dude. So what <laughs> no. the okay. fuck happened? So you, you've, got, you've got partial details of this correct. Uh, yeah. but, 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 but some of it's also incorrect. So um, okay. by the time we showed up, the chair had been reelected. Uh, 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 Angela, Angela, Mc Angela McCardo. And she was the one who told MAGA to get out of the seat. Yes. To please, she, she, pretty she's please, the one that can came you up. be nice? Yeah. Okay. Well, so she was a bit more forceful than that. She, she came up and said something to the effect of, I, I have promised all of our delegates these things, and I'm going to ask them. It to sounded to me like, this is our house, and y'all sat at the head table, like, get the fuck out. <laughs> it was a little, <laughs> yes. More... A Angela's not a blanching character, and she's very ca she's very capable of being direct with a large group of people. Yes. Um, yeah. So they had not selected their presidential candidate at that time when we were there. Okay. Uh, the the guy that the, the guy that was high as a kite, who had very weird, <laughs> very weird. <laughs> Dad thinks he's a rock star energy. Oh like my imagine, God. Su imagine suburban dad who's never done karaoke before and suddenly is taken with the spirit of Freddie Mercury in a very stilted, he awkward kind of way. Like is like, like, like seriously amped up and like pacing to one side of the stage, declaring something like taking a weird deep breath and then pay, like, like, well, no, it was like was, even worse, even worse. He comes up and they, and, and Rechtenwald's got, uh, at that point he was slated to be the nominee in that he was the choice of the Mises caucus who had the most delegates there at the convention. So okay. So is that why I thought everything, that? If he, everything he was, he was had gone according to Hoyle. He was the presumed nominee because Angela the had just been reelected. Okay. The, the Mises caucus was and is ascendant. He is their guy. And so he was thought to be the front runner and he, he, was, won, thought, he was thought to be that. He'd won a straw poll the previous day or a yes. debate or something. There's some, there's some non-committal activity he'd won, and that's why he was uh, given so he comes up to speak. And he gets a ovation because he's known, but it's not, like, deafening. He just no. gets cheered. It's certainly well enough for him to just walk to the podium and start talking. But instead, he does the walk, like, if... It's the walk that's normally designed to quiet down the crowd so you don't have to tell the crowd to be quiet. So you just sort of walk around and like pump your fist in front of people. But the the audience died down by the time he got to the left side of the stage and they were absolutely silent by yeah. the time that he makes his way to the right side of the stage and then comes back for what Jen very aptly described as one of the most awkward speeches I've ever seen. And the way he ended it, guys, like picture Justin Robert Young at the end of a Patreon episode where he just goes, bye. <laughs> like, that's what he did. He just like yelled something and fucked off. I was like, where did he yeah. go? Well, he tried to get his, he has a catchphrase to wreck the regime. 
Yes. But people were not into the catchphrase and he didn't so he just went into it he didn't say like <laughs> we're gonna wreck the regime huh we're gonna wreck the regime say it with me we're gonna wreck the regime he just goes blah 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 hands up wreck the regime seven people repeat him like it was <laughs> and then he just leaves and then yeah. <laughs> He fucks 50, right off in the cloud. Fifty percent of me, fifty yeah. percent of me is like, how can you get high right before you give a speech before President Trump? But also fifty percent of me is like, I kind of like that. I kind of like the Libertarian <laughs> front runner was like, fuck it, I'm gonna do edibles right before President Trump comes up. Like, so I'm, I'm divided on this. We, we we don't know whether or not he was on edibles for that speech. We do know he has I admitted hope he, was. he has admitted that he was on edibles for after when we all left the party. Uh, I mean, that's uh, fine. No. On that stage, they had a debate between, I believe, Michael Rechtenwald, Chase Oliver, who is now the nominee, and oh. Mike Termat, uh, who is now the vice presidential nominee. Uh, they were having a debate, and Rechtenwald just peaced. He <laughs> said, I don't like these questions, and just left. Wow. Now, who knows whether or not that, he then later admitted he was on edibles, and so he was a little freaked out. Uh, uh, but... <laughs> I mean, we've been there. <laughs> who, who knows whether or not that was enough? Uh, uh, Angela McCardle, the head of the, the the chairwoman, who is also a Mises Caucus person, said that it was more of a situation where a lot of Mises Caucus people left on se- on Sunday night. They went home on Sunday night as opposed well, to staying to Monday, and so they lost their voting advantage. And that's why Chase Oliver, who is somebody that the Mises Caucus loathes got the nomination. So, and it's interesting you say that. So on Sunday, my flight was on time, supposed to take off at five, got on the plane. We were leaving and like, I was Southwest. So I was lined up with people and there was a guy in a big cowboy hat and he had libertarian shit all over him. So we kind of chatted a little bit and he was a delegate for the Mises caucus and he was leaving. And he was telling me that there was a few other people that he recognized on our flight. So there were people that were leaving. And when my flight got six and a half hours, hours delayed um i was texting with andrew and then it was still going on so there were people on my flight that weren't there for this that weren't expecting it to happen um while all that chaos was happening uh Heaton, can you please bring us into that room in the basement of the hinkley yeah. hilton of washington dc so as, as you all will recall your intrepid co-host was invited to participate in a dancing with the stars style competition uh, yeah. with, with one of the resident uh, libertarian celebrities with whom I am friends, uh, we were going to do Wagon Wheel. However, we had an emergency meeting beforehand and decided that because I had worn my white dinner jacket from 2003 senior prom, that it wasn't really the correct costume for it. Uh, so we, we ended up comparing notes. We decided to go with, uh, I think, a Glenn Miller type thing, which would have been even more heaton to be dancing. Yes, <laughs> Glenn Miller. Yes. Uh, I assume that's what you're talking about, Justin. Is you want to know the dance details, or do you want to know about I, the? Uh, the... Well, I want, also, like, I, how I, did Chase I, Oliver I, become the nominee? Well, that's what I need. Yeah, yeah. I just bring us in. Give us the yeah. heat and experience so, so as he waits, I, I all dappled in, up. <laughs> I, I came in. I, I wasn't even really going to watch the other stuff. Um, I, I uh, but but I, I came in and like came maybe the third round. So the way it works in the, the libertarian bylaws is. Um, it's it's kind of like ranked choice voting, s- similar in that uh, somebody has to get fifty percent plus one to be the nominee. Absent that, you do another round of voting. Everybody votes again, but you drop. It, it's either a threshold of like whoever has less than five percent, or just whoever's the the next lowest one. I think it's the five percent thing. Anybody lower than five percent, uh, something like that, gets knocked out. So uh, by by round three, it's gone from like seven people that were, were running that had booths that had campaigned and everything, and it's now down to maybe like four people. And it's clear that there's two front runners. There's Michael Rechtenwald, the uh, high dad energy guy Stoner. that we discussed earlier. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Chase Oliver, uh, the, the, the ultimate nominee. Um, and so every time this round is happening, more and more people are being dropped off. But it's, I'm, I'm having a great time, by the way, because I'm, I'm not... I'm not nearly as invested in this as everybody else. I'm not a member of the Libertarian Party, any any proclivities notwithstanding. So, like, I'm watching people write in. Like, it's literally when I sat down, it was clearly a race between Oliver and Rechtenwald, followed by Nota, none of the above, which you can always write on the Libertarian ballot, followed by, in fourth or fourth place, <laughs> Dan Marino, Courtney Love, Donald Trump and RFK Jr. <laughs> and wow. uh, I have to appreciate that 
whoever this was, there, there, were, there was at least two delegates that clearly wanted to write none of the above. They went, fuck it, I don't think we're there yet. I'm going to write a Dan Marino. <laughs> we just write in shit. <laughs> so I was like, great, we're having fun. We're having fun. At this point, as I'm laughing that Dan Marino and Courtney Love are technically on the board, uh, as, as a joke, to be clear, um, uh, a guy from, I think, uh, Massachusetts sat down and, and kind of walked me through what was happening. Now, I, I need to, to clarify this out of journalistic integrity here. Uh, I have the most unfettered access at libertarian conventions than I've ever had to anything in my entire life because people know me from Reason videos, so I can literally go up to anybody and go, hey, I'm that funny guy from Reason, not the one who sings, the less popular one. I'm that one. Can I talk to you for a yeah. minute? And then they'll want to. <laughs> and so I can talk to anybody and just... Everybody and there are people in there hate each other. They're like they're but like despise somebody came, each other. My my favorite comment, somebody came up with Andrew Heaton. I think you're the least hated libertarian in America. <laughs> and I went, well, I only identify as an independent. You and Dave but Smith, I, but I, they but love I really, him. <laughs> I really appreciate that. I'm least hated. I'm I'm the 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 most tepid of of that crowd. Yeah. So I could kind of talk to everybody. So a guy from uh, Massachusetts sat down. Now he was in the uh, classical liberal anti-Mises caucus caucus. So he was, this was his perspective, but what he told me was that the Mises caucus people hated Chase Oliver. They did not want him to take the nomination. And so when it became clear that they did not have sufficient votes to beat him outright, they changed their tactic to try to convince all of the losing candidates people that were getting flushed out to vote NOTA, none of the above. And their goal was to get NOTA to win so that the the libertarian candidate would have been Noda. Because Noda's not a person, none of the above's not a person. You can't remove that on a ballot. It's always an available option. So while the other people were dropping out, Noda was becoming bigger and bigger. And their goal was to get Noda to win, at which point one of two things would have happened. Either A, the libertarians would not have fielded a candidate in the election. Noda would have won, and that would have been it. The libertarians wouldn't, which would have been disastrous for the libertarians for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which is a number of ballot issues. Uh, a number of ballots would have been lost and had to be rebuilt from the ground up and that kind of thing. Um, I'm told from Mises Caucus people, at least the couple that I spoke to, that that wasn't actually the goal. Their goal was to basically flush the entire thing and having disavowed all of those candidates, find a compromise candidate like Spike Cohen, who had who'd been the VP candidate in the last election, that everybody could get behind him or something. So I don't know. E either, either. So they were going to do more voting after 16 hours of voting? They're like, one, like one, let, one let's spike two, this. and the, 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 the Mises caucus were looking to do one of two things or perhaps were divided on. And I, I, I have no means by which to determine this. Either some, some of them literally would prefer no candidate over Chase Oliver, and they would rather just not have a candidate, or alternately, they were looking to scrub the whole thing and get just a new slate of candidates entirely, uh, and, and thinking that they could do that. That didn't end up happening. Chase Oliver took it. Uh, he, he got the uh, presidential nomination. The Libertarians got him, and then his preferred VP candidate also took it. Uh, and so uh, they, they did get a candidate. I have a and, yeah. What is their problem with Chase Oliver? Because I heard him yesterday on Rising talking to Robbie and Bree, mm -hmm. and he represented the party extremely well. He was articulate. No. He explained his policies, his personal reasons, and the parties. Um, I actually think they ended up with a pretty good candidate. So what's their problem with the dude? He seems great. I, I am in agreement with you. And keep in mind that I am somebody that likes Gary Johnson and even Bill Weld. So I, I, I want I like the low the moral character caucus <laughs> type people. Yes, 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 yes. I like those kind of guys. Um, uh, that that is temperamentally where I'm at. And I think a lot of the there's a lot of ideological torpor going on within the Libertarian Party between the Mises caucus people who tend to be anarchists and the classical liberal people, which tend to have they want a government but a small government. Uh, and then there's also okay. a big temperamental difference. The, the temperamental difference that I see is the classical liberal Gary Johnson people are thinking about how to grow the coalition. They want a, a character that can articulate the party well without offending people that might potentially vote for it that will be a respected candidate. Uh, the Mises Caucus people, and by the way, I kept thinking of you, Justin. I think you would love to talk to the Mises Caucus people. I think it would be fascinating for you to interview oh, yeah. uh, An Angela McArdle um, because I think, weirdly, you will appreciate their position. Uh, the, the Mises Caucus people temperamentally are, are kind of having two things. One, I think they really hate Democrats a lot more than the other libertarians do. I, 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 this yes. is my interpretation. I think that there's a significant amount of what I would call a schismogenesis of we just fucking hate the, the blue team. But then the other bit that I think you would appreciate, Justin, is that the Mises Caucus thinks of itself as the true true pragmatists here. They, they, they see like they, they look at the Gary Johnson people and go, 
you guys are doing cosplay. Every four years, you get up and pretend that you're running an actual election and that you're an actual contender, and you're not. You're never, we're never going to get it. We're, we're, the, the Mises Caucus people go, we're the realists. We're aware we're a third party. We're aware we're not going to, we're not going to, that like the goal is to get 5%. That would be victory. Oh, wow. Okay. We know we're not going to get it. So knowing that we're not going to win, we're going to try to leverage the tools available to us outside of victory in order to get the policy outcomes we desire. For example, we're going to invite Donald Trump to speak at our convention, provided yeah. that he agrees to free Ross Ulbricht. We will, we will try to pressure the Republican or Democratic Party to go in the way we want, as opposed to winning an election outright. So um, Chase Oliver represents that more respectable, uh, he seems like a palatable character, Mm -hmm. May or may not vote for him, but he seems like a nice guy. Whereas the Mises caucus is much more of the fuck it, let's go culture war, let's be divisive. We're, they are we're not very, gonna win this. Very so let's, culture war. Let's yeah. let's go let's go full troll and we'll get other trolls because all these non all the normies were never gonna vote for us anyway. Fuck them. That's kind of where they're at, from what I can tell. Um, the reason that they don't like Chase Oliver, based on my input that I got from the Mises caucus, I think was threefold. Um, uh, they do they the, the Mises Caucus people are very, very uh, skeptical or in outright arms of any type of treatment that children might get that would affirm transgender to them. That is, uh, I'm trying to be as, as uh, careful and accurate as I can, that would have any permanent effect. So I don't, I, I, actually, if everybody I heard just said, uh, maybe there's exceptions here. All the Mises Caucus people I talked to said any type of gender affirming care children are given is child abuse and should be illegal. If we're going to have laws regarding children, it should be illegal. Chase Oliver's position is, I, I think, broadly within the libertarian remit, that this is something that most rightly should be between parents and doctors, not between yeah. children and politicians. You can disagree with that. I think that that's still broadly a libertarian position, but that's where he's at. But the Mises Caucus people are, are openly calling him a groomer, that he is, he is okay with children uh, going through... Uh, gender affirming care that's going to fuck them up could include. I, I think he said in the past maybe that he's he would be okay with uh, puberty blockers or something. Uh, I don't know. I I literally did not know. He has he has people. fallen more more solidly within the the uh, uh, mainstream LGBT uh, battery of issues. Yeah, you don't uh, have uh, to like explain for them. That yeah, that explains yeah. the thanks. And I'm yeah. I, like, and, and again, we're keep, keep mind all of this uh, is is information that heat and gathered that night we're moving forward so this is not anything that i've yeah. got I, I i i will also say just just my general skim is that he was more uh amiable to lock down stuff and so that's yes. like that that's has the other become bit. a big that's a the other big, so th yeah Ch Ch chase chase oliver um uh, while most of the libertarian candidates either start out as a Republican or a Democrat, like Gary Johnson or Bill Weld, Chase Oliver started out as a Democrat. He was a gay activist and HR manager in the state of Georgia um, and uh, was a Democrat up until I, I don't remember when he decided to become libertarian. I don't remember. What Obama. His, I, I think it was it Obama. OK, mm -hmm. uh, I, I thought it was later than that. But in any event, he he's kind of coming at this from I got into the libertarian party because I'm a peace activist. And the uh, the Democrats, the Republicans are both part of the warfare state. And mm -hmm. he has become libertarian following all of that in terms of his economics and things like that. But yes, to Justin's point, he was more amenable to uh, lockdowns. And I, I don't know the f I, I don't know what his position was, but he was like like the, the Mises caucus is just very, very, very skeptical or antithetical to anything involving the vaccines or lockdowns in any capacity that it like it's kind of. Um, the, the, the rhetoric that I hear from them is very much the, you know, Fauci is a fraud. This is big pharma. The vaccine was bullshit. Um, it was perpetuated by an unholy alliance of the state and big pharma to make money. So they're, they're very, very skeptical of it in, in general and see him as being complacent with vaccines and lockdowns and things like that. And then um, the third provision, I don't remember now off the top of my head. Those are the two that really st stuck out to me. I, I think, think yeah, cult, culture war and lockdown are, I mean, one yeah. is kind of more specific to the Mises caucus, which is they are very much uh, to, they are involved actively in the right wing culture war ecosystem. And, yes. and, and my, my, Michael Rechtenwald is a regular guest on the Tim Pool podcast, which is pretty much oh nine ninety nine percent uh uh culture war kind yeah. of stuff. And then and then there's the more hardcore the state should never be able to lock yeah, anybody down my, kind of my, stuff. My that, read on the Mises they caucus like. is yeah. I think that there's the, the there's a the, the core people in the Mises caucus are anarchists who who believe that the the state is always illegitimate. 
uh, and that there's no real ethical difference between a mob protection racket and the state. So that's kind of where they're coming at ideologically. Mm -hmm. But I I met a lot of people in the Mises Caucus that I would describe as just anti-leftist, that it, it didn't seem to me that they were so much anarchists or that they were so much built around a particular ideology as they just really, really fucking despise blue team. And and there's a mix and there's, you know, overlap and things like that. But those are the those are the two kind of impulses that I see coming out of the Mises caucus, along with that temperamental one I described earlier of let's be pragmatic. Let's we're not going for normies. We're going for the edges, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, okay. thank you they, for they, that explanation. Yeah. And they, they see Chase Oliver as appealing to the normies. And that's a fool's errand. And, and the, the, the libertarians are once again yielding a nothing candidate that will do nothing. And it would have been smarter to either not have a candidate or to have a firebrand culture war type character i don't know maybe not this cycle but the, maybe the, we the could ironic have... thing is like like the the other bit too is I, I talked to a few people that hate chase oliver because they see him as giving the georgia election to a democrat so in mm -hmm. the georgia election he ran as the libertarian candidate for senate against uh herschel walker and herschel walker that... and raphael warnock Ra raphael warnock who ultimately prevailed herschel walker didn't participate in the senatorial debate Probably very smartly because I do not think he would have done a very good job. No, Herschel Walker uh, did. I was there. Oh, he did. No, yes. no, it was the Democrat that showed up to the debate, wasn't it? It was both of them. I. It's they, my they, understanding. Warnock, one, one Warnock of the debates, and Walker debated uh, uh, each other. Okay, one of the debates Chase Oliver was at, and the Democrat oh, was at. Oh, yes. Herschel Walker was not at that debate. Yes, um, there was another so, one. Not, not, not the first one. Yes. Yeah. And so th there, there were some people that I talked to that were angry that Herschel Walker had been the spoiler. In a, in a democratic contest, okay. which uh, I, I find fat because that was the same shit people were saying about Gary Johnson. But again, if you're like, listen, I believe in libertarianism, but at the end of the day, the Democrats fucking suck. Like that was kind of that that thing. Um, so I, I think some of the people were, were mad about that. Um, and uh, let's look to the future, <laughs> because there was a very interesting tweet that happened, Heaton. And that is Angela McArdle, <laughs> who we've referred to many times uh -huh. on this particular segment as uh, the. Chair, uh, uh, Andrew of the Heaton. Party. This is a a a tweet from a a lovely person uh, who says they're just here for the memes and says he at Mighty Heaton, Heaton will get the vote uh, every time. A picture of Heaton during I in believe yeah I, I believe a New Year's Eve party uh, in my backyard. So my backyard is the is the the uh, 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 backdrop here. Angela McArdle retweeting that and saying recruit this man for 2028 and so <laughs> i ask uh the one and only esteemed panelist on this very show do you have interest in the libertarian nomination in 2028 not as such at this time but that's a long <laughs> way in the future good answer good answer <laughs> Good answer. Uh, I was I was surprised. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, run one campaign on this fucking podcast. Yeah. I'm gonna run one um, campaign. <laughs> I so so uh, a few things. I'm friends with Dave Smith. I introduced Jen up there. I I've known Dave for several years. I like Dave. Mm -hmm. I don't it, didn't you know, introduce just, me. Had a whole conversation. Didn't. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had, I had, I had to introduce seen myself. Dave. That's fine. I've seen Dave in like three, four, four, maybe four mm -hmm. or five years. In and I'm not a person. So, that's fine. Yeah. yeah that's, apologies. You were so sitting apologies. right there. You could have come with us, big baby. No, no, no. <laughs> earlier. No, no, earlier. this is earlier. Because I'd already oh, okay. seen Dave. Yeah, yeah. And I, and just, just, no, I, I just pointed him out for you guys to go yeah. over there. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what are yeah, you? Yeah. No, this um, was this was earlier. Uh, uh, and I've, I've met Angela. I met Angela back when I, in my ill-fated trip to Los Angeles, where she was living at the time. Her and her husband now live in Austin, Texas. I've, I've seen them at, a, at an event in Austin uh, at least once since I moved there. Um... Uh, Angela was very nice to me when I met her. She wasn't yet the party chair. Uh, she was part of the insurgency of the Mises Caucus and invited me to hang out at like you know uh, anti-lockdown events that they were doing in secret, where they you know I, I don't know drink or play Dungeons and Dragons or whatever people do that were were evading these things. Um, yeah, challenge so we, each other's on Robert's Rules of Order. We, we've been we've been friendly before. I'm I'm surprised that she would deign to put that up because I don't. I don't think I strike anybody as a Mises Caucus type person, like both in terms of how I comport myself or what I'm saying. So I'm kind of surprised by that. That being, Okay, all that being said, though, if Dave Smith ran in 2028 and he wanted a comedian sidekick as a VP, it would be a very funny campaign. I got to say that if it was me and Dave as a ticket and the goal is to be funny, I think it would be really we're not. Yeah, funny. we're not we're not ruling anything off the table. The Heat in 28 campaign is not making any kind of statements right now. Uh, he's a very 
a busy man. Uh, he is supporting the the nominee. Are you supporting the nominee, Chase Oliver? He said he doesn't. I, know. He doesn't know. I have not. He is, have he is not currently any, assessing his options I'm on on it. But on uh, 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 yeah, we will we will uh, circle I, back on that when we get a chance. Just really yes, quick though, because I've been having just like feelings about the ex- entire experience because I've never been to a convention before, and um, you know this whole process. Like I I get that it's fun and funny and it was ridiculous and. Um, but I kept sitting there thinking, this is the only, like, we have Trump versus Biden, which are two choices I think we all agree no one wants. And this is the only party that has 50 state ballot access. And to watch the way in which that nominee was picked and to be in the room and, like, like I said, every single individual I met there was absolutely lovely. But at no time was I like, was I like these are the people I want to trust with picking the most powerful person in the world. And yet this was the small group of people that got to pick the third person that's going to be on every ballot and voters had no say in it. It was clearly a chaotic process. Um, just zooming out on it, just on a democracy level left me with a very ominous vibe. And, um, which <laughs> it got worse because after you guys left, I went for a walk to the white house cause it was just closer to the line that I was staying on. And I was like, Oh, I'll just like, Go take a picture of the White House. I like to take pictures for tourists. So I went down there to do that. And right as I see the top corner of the White House, as I turn the corner, a lightning bolt strikes right behind it. I was like, oh, my God, these vibes. I need to get out of D.C. Um, But I left that trip feeling whatever the opposite of inspired is. That's what I left feeling. I can't wait until we do the big conventions. Yeah, Am I going to want to hang myself? Because you might. I, I think <laughs> it's so. going to be so dope. It's yeah, going to be so awesome. Let, let me. Yeah, I. I, I'll, I'll, I think I, I had. You might start time. drinking and then I'm, quit I'm, drinking at the DNC. <laughs> you're going to start drinking again at the RNC because you're like, well, this isn't working. I need to drink, and then you're going to go to the DNC and say, "Fuck it, I need to double back." <laughs> so, Possible. so Jen, I, I wish you'd gone down to the floor. I, th- I think that that actually would have been a lot more informative because you saw, you saw a. An entertainment event. You saw a party. Was, yeah, you 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 saw a a, a speaker. Uh, you you saw you did not see any type of deliberative action at any point. You saw a line of speakers, which is a different thing. I yeah. wish you'd seen which, the deliberative. The action. reason I didn't, I wanted to go and watch their actual debate. That was the thing I was most excited about. But because they can't even govern themselves. The schedule got completely fucked up, and the debate happened before I even woke the up on tag, Saturday the morning. The tagline was "become ungovernable." Yeah, which is also a problem it's for on me. the ten. So I know so, uh, it's. But, uh, I didn't like that at all. I put it on I, my story. I, I, I wish that you'd. I wish you'd been down there because I think you would have met several people that you would have been very impressed with. I, I think, uh, aside yes, from ideology, which c- clearly you're going to disagree with the libertarians and ideology, I think you would have genuinely appreciated how passionate they were about about their political positions and how engaged they were. I think you also would have found, yeah. like there were a couple of people that I talked to, like like there there are weirdos there. There are also some very intelligent people that like you would no, have had 100%. a similar- 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get me, don't yeah, get yeah, me yeah. twisted because I said right. every single right. person that I yeah, talked yeah. to, except for the journalist who creeped yeah. me out, um, every single person I really liked. This is not a statement about anyone yes. who's in that room. It's the right. process. Right. Like that just a small group of people picking this for the yeah. entire country. I understand. This is literally how every presidential nominee was selected up until 1972. Which doesn't make it good. I'm not so, saying it's good. I'm saying that so, if you agree that America, you know, functioned well, up until 1972. They're doing a they're doing a caucus as opposed to a primary. But I real, real quick, what I was going to say is I wish you'd been able to meet some of the people. And and, and to be very clear, that Jen has not said anything negative about the libertarians. And I'm, I, 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 that and, and and she was uh, uh, delightful and having a good time while there. For any libertarians listening, um, but like I, I hung out with several people on the floor that are members of city councils that I think you really would have enjoyed talking to. I think that yeah. you would have enjoyed speaking policy to them, and I think you would have felt a lot more comfortable talking to like there was a guy from Oklahoma that I recognize uh, that's a, a city councilman for Bethany that you you would have I think like found a lot of uh, stuff there. In, in I terms have no of doubt. the in in terms of the like the the ominous bit, um, like it, it's a caucus rather than a primary. Um, so that is to say that, like, I'll, I'll argue it is much easier to get your input if you care about who the libertarian candidate is. It is much, much, much easier for you as a citizen to have input in that process than it is in the Republican or Democratic process. In yeah. the libertarian process, 
you just become a delegate. And there's plenty of places in the United States where you just literally show up at the meeting, if they have one, and go, do you have any spots open for delegates? And they're like, oh, yeah, we've got three spots open right now. Uh, or you hang out for three meetings, and the, of the 15 people there, they get to elect five delegates or something like that. So I, I think in terms of people having input, they can do it. Uh, I also, I would be very Can I surprised. pause you right there for a second? Yeah. yeah. Because that, that definitely occurred to me, too. Where I was sitting here, and I, it, it was a relatively small room. I've been to weddings that were bigger than that. Um, there weren't a lot of people there, and I was def- definitely like, this small group of people is picking the third person on every ballot. The enormous amount of power that each individual that shows up gets in that room, like just the, and I was really impressed by these people for having the foresight to be like, be, by becoming a delegate and getting myself in this room. I'm giving myself an enormous amount of power. So it's like, I actually really respected every single person that I met there for being that engaged, for having that foresight, for understanding how that party works and for getting involved. I really respect that. But just zooming out as a citizen in the United States, seeing that amount of power in that small of a room yeah, that well, I, 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 I really, I really wish that you had come down to the floor yeah. because that it's was a, a much larger. bigger room. There was a yeah, lot, there was a lot more people down you're, there. You're, you're seeing a like you, we probably yeah. you were seeing you were seeing that. The fact also, that it was the room of this one hotel is what <laughs> democracy looks like. This Which is, my, is what my, my broader bit is that, looks that's, like. That's, that's kind of my thing. Is like, like this that. is d- democracy and politics are the same thing. When we talk about like, should we have something settled by the democratic process? Should we have something settled by politics? We're exact same thing. And it's messy. The democratic process is yeah. really messy. Uh, it's really chaotic. Like, if, if you're not being particularly democratic and the party's just staging everything, you can make it a lot smoother. Um, but I don't know what the alternative would be. Because, like, like, the, the primary. So, so, That's so many expensive. states. Well, plus, plus, like, keep in mind, yeah. a lot of the state, states don't want the fucking third parties on the ballot anyway. Yeah. Like, they're, they're not, like, a lot of the states aren't going to allow, even if the libertarians wanted to, which I doubt they would, a lot of the states aren't going to let them be on it because that's going to be resources the state is doing for a third party they don't want to do. Um, and then the other bit, too, is like, um, you know, if, if you wanted to have open primaries for everybody, maybe I'd be okay with that. But at the moment, like, um, you know, I, I think the libertarians should be able to choose their own candidate. And, and the way to yeah, do it is to go through the like libertarian said, party like, rather than. I'm zooming way out here. So I'm at the point now where I think all parties are bad. So there's just like, I don't like the way that the, you know, the Democrats, I was first radicalized when I found out about their fucking super delegates and how unfair that all is. Um, out of the three, the Republicans actually seem to run the most fair process, but it's still like private rules. They get to determine them themselves as do the libertarians. I don't like that we have parties in general and just having sitting in the room, I don't think the libertarians are doing anything wrong, Mm. but just like the party structure and just seeing like, I'm looking at the big picture here. We have three people on the ballot and this is how one of them was picked. And I just, it just made me even more disturbed by the state of our politics. And I just, I I would like to have, I I didn't love it. Weirdly. I would like to have stronger parties, but more open primaries. What I mean by that is like, if, if you go to Britain, you would, I think hate Britain then because Britain is completely closed primaries for everything except the prime minister. Like like the the conservatives and the labor they don't have primaries. Well, yeah, that's it's why we got the, out of their system in uh, 1776. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but they, they, they have they have really they have really tight selection processes where you're just you, you've been a, a good old boy member of the Tories for the last. You 20 just get years named. And, you're and you're, you're, you're running you. here, and yeah. we're and, not. And, then, and they'll they'll para drop people not. too, where you're not even from there. So so like. Um, what I, I I'm fine with parties having tight control. In fact, I think there's an argument to be made that tightly controlled parties that govern themselves rather than having input from the the outside non members end up running better candidates because they're thinking more strategically rather than thinking in terms of anger and trying to just demagogue. But the way that we have to couple that is the actual ballot process, the actual democracy needs to belong to the people and not the parties. So right yeah. now, what we do is we have this kind of weird semi-open party system where the parties, particularly the big two, the, the parties function as quasi-governmental entities. And they, the, the parties function as gatekeepers for the populace to vote on. And I think it's backwards. So what we ought to do is 
parties should be able to select whoever the fuck they want according to whatever metrics they want. If the Republicans just want to have uh, their own delegates like before 1962, I'm fine with that. But they should have no, no more power on who shows up on the ballot than when the firefighters union endorses somebody. The firefighters union should also be 100% capable of saying, we really like this particular candidate, they get our endorsement. The, the problem I have right now is that the parties operate as gatekeepers. What, what I would want is whoever has the top five signature amounts, like whoever just gets the most signatures, those five people wind up on the ballot. And it should be multiple people from different parties. If, Like in, in Oklahoma, where I'm from, if you had the top five candidates, it would probably be three Republicans, a Democrat, and a Libertarian. But the benefit to the people in that would be the Republican Party could pick one of those people and go, this, is, this person gets the official endorsement of the Republican Party of Oklahoma. Great. You could still get two other Republicans that didn't get it that ran, and you'd have the ability of the population as a whole, when we get to vote on our elected leaders, to make the decision ourselves. Where, uh, in this instance, you'd have three different types of Republicans, where you'd go, yeah. that one's a nutball, that one's a moderate, that one I like. Uh, or, or whatever, right? So that, that's what I want to do. I, I, I don't think the way to do it so much is, like I, I share much of your umbrage and I think our electoral system's fucked up. But, but in, in my kind of, the, the way my brain works is I would want the parties to quit being gatekeepers. And once yeah. that's established, I don't really care how tight or loose they are. Okay. No, I understand gonna... that. And this, I think this is something that we're going to disagree on long-term. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. And we're going to cut it here because we have a lot of fucking emails and we've already gone super long in this episode. So, uh, uh, we're not wrong pot at gmail.com blocked by Robert's rules of order. We're not wrong pot at gmail.com is where you need to send your email. Sweat it out. Rice jury should check out the wet bulb temperature readings and some places around the globe where the heat and humidity is so high that the human body is incapable of cooling itself and people essentially cook to death, TLDR, Jen and Heaton for the win. I honestly think that was here for the last two weeks. I had a volleyball practice the last two Tuesdays, and, and there, it was only 45 minutes. It wasn't even a long one. And in both of them, I couldn't finish the practice. I had to, like, sit down for an entire exercise because I just I got dizzy, got a little nauseous, like... And the thing was that my temperature reading, I know that if it's under 100 degrees, I'm generally fine to do whatever I want outside. And it said that it was 98 yesterday. But with the heat index that Justin doesn't believe in, mm -hmm. it said it was 112 and I wanted to die. So Maybe you should stop filling your head with fake numbers. Fake <laughs> numbers, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm planning to head back on Friday, but based on what you're saying, Jen, maybe I'll push it back by a couple of years. <laughs> Fake Just numbers, right? Pool. Justin knows and everybody else should recognize. It doesn't matter if you're measuring temperature with Celsius or Fahrenheit scales. That number is a reflection of temperature, and that number does not reflect UVI index. It does not indicate the humidity or is it an indication of temperature, temperature period. If you're standing on the sun and your body cannot sweat fast enough to maintain, or if the humidity is high and your body's sweat mechanism cannot compensate, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. It makes you more uncomfortable, but the temperature, the heat is still the temperature, and it feels like the temperature. Nailed it. It's just an insane thing to say, right? If uh, it didn't sound like an insane thing to say, I'd almost be tempted to accuse the Biden administration campaign of actively trying to lose. I mean, the way they're running, man, I don't think you're all that insane. They're doing a terrible job. Biden is no LBJ rights. He doesn't have the dick. Did LBJ you know, have a big dong? Oh, yeah. How do we know this? When, uh, he famously would go skinny dipping with donors. It is hot around here. Uh, uh, and apparently <laughs> and he, he, and he would with drop trow and shit in front of him. He, he'd uh, he'd yeah. drop trow in front of uh, office members. He, he would just, he'd be in a meeting with an assistant and would go, hold, and w without breaking stride, would just open the door to the bathroom, sit on the shitter and keep talking to them. So a lot of nudity in the LBJ White House. Oh, clearly before me too. <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah. No, uh, LBJ was like, he was part of why he was a, a good legislator is that he would know when to like just straight out mob boss bully people. But in the tapes that he recorded of his conversations, because again, he put in the taping system that Nixon got busted for. Uh, he, you could hear him when he ever wanted to control people. He would say like, oh, no, just make sure you don't take my wife from me. Oh, boy, you're so strong, so handsome, so virile. Like, oh, I'll bet you my wife would just leave me. You're you got a big a old pecker lover. on you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a little bit of pecker. I got like, a like, tiny like, little pecker. Yeah. Just what I'm learning about Ladybird here is that Ladybird has quite a big nest. <laughs> Ladybird. <laughs> Woof. Woof. Source, trust me, bro, writes... My brother-in-law told me that the people he knows in the L.A. area who are rich and plugged into the Democratic Party say that Biden will resign between the convention and the election. Harris will take over and pardon him for anything he's done, and then Newsom will step in as the candidate. 
I mean, sounds better than what they're doing. In Mexico, candidates are, are allowed to bring a prop on stage. I hope that CNN will learn from Mexico and allow Trump and Biden to bring props to the debate. A live meme war between these two candidates would be huge in the ratings and be much more entertaining than listening to them talk over each other. Do you guys have any hopes or suggestions for the uh, uh, upcoming debate? What could they change now that they are untethered from the stodgy rules of the Commission on Presidential Debates? I think that they should be required to eat whatever Michael Rechtenwald gives them shortly before going up on stage. <laughs> I endorse this proposal. <laughs> Windy City Shakes writes, I get uncomfortable at the excitement for protesting chaos as the sword of the people's will at the DNC. I think Jen is a little too sunshine-filled thinking in what these protests will be. I work in downtown Chicago. I work in the property industry. And we're scared shitless as riots in the Chicago loop and being more busted up again like they were during the 2020 BLM riots. The group's being denied protest permits don't want to protest. They want to riot. They have said so, and the city isn't uh, going to just uh, walk in and uh, the city isn't going to just let walk in like Trojan horse. Just because they're getting some voice, uh, some voice by an awful alderman doesn't give them credibility. We're so afraid of what this summer will bring to Chicago, and if 1968's ghost will scare us again by outside agitators. I want WNW and the rest of the world to see why I love my city so much. It's not the joke that Trump says we are. So I was hoping that people would understand that I was not serious when I said I wanted riots, because I don't. I don't want a single window broken. I hate vandalism so much. You have no idea. It's one of my biggest pet peeves in society that we allow it at all. Um, I don't want any of that to happen. But I would like to see a million Americans show up peacefully protesting on the streets, especially if this war in Gaza is still happening. I think there are things to protest. And if we are in this awful choice between Trump and Biden, where, as we discussed in the first half of this show, we have a man who says that he's immune from the law running. He's clearly an unacceptable choice. If we're giving Biden four more years, I think he has to be shown in some way how unhappy with him that we are. That said, I don't think rioting is ever the answer. I don't think breaking Walgreens windows in any way sends a good message. Anytime that happens, it just it takes the focus away from whatever you're protesting to the violence that you yourself are perpetrating that people hate. And as a longtime resident of Oakland, you know, Justin lived there too. Right, riots on a national level. Yeah, like anytime something happened anywhere in the country, we had our entire Broadway just destroyed. We had people driving trucks through windows and just so many broken windows to the point that a lot of businesses just never came back. I don't want that for Chicago. I've been to Chicago many times. I have family in Chicago. I also love Chicago. No one, I mean, I can't say no one. I don't want to see that happen, but I would like to see a mass mobilization of people showing their displeasure to a president who so far hasn't really been swayed. Biden's got a ceasefire plan. It's all going to wrap it up. You know, I it's am going to wrap it up. That is an interesting one because it does seem like he announced that Israel said yes to a thing that they didn't actually say. This is the first time I've seen Biden like dust off his balls a little bit and make an actual play for peace. So this is the first thing he's done where I'm like, OK, Biden, let's see if this works. But I need to see a lot more. Look, it, it, it's a peace plan that needs to be agreed to by Hamas. So we're just going to wait on Hamas to do it. I'm right. sure they're going to be totally into it. <laughs> On Millier writes, fast or slow, I'm an economist and I agree that we want no subsidies, a smaller government, free trade, and a free market. Still, there is a question on how to introduce these things to a country. Brazil defeated inflation by a process that took over five years. China switched to the free market started in 1978, but is still happening. Many of the companies are still state-owned. But sudden shifts like Chile's policies under the Chicago boys resulted in a nosedive to GDP, and in Russia it led to a rise of oligarchs. Perhaps slow and steady is better than shock therapy. Heaton, answer for your free market cabal. Um, I think that this is a very good question. Uh, I'll answer it in two parts. The first one is, on a scale of 1 to 10, my familiarity with the intricacies and nuances of the Argentine economy is maybe a 2. So I, I lack the ability to get into the details on what that would look like. In terms of your, your broader question, I think that there's a point there and I think it would probably have to do with both what the rollout is and how bad the damage is existing in the economy. So you bring up um, the Soviet Union's collapse. I think the, the two things that happened with the Soviet Union's privatization, which was desperately needed in a bad sclerotic economy, was, one, they didn't have any type of social safety net that came in for people that were left out of the old Soviet system. So Russia's now a new federation. 
Um, you're 65 years old. You were in a shitty sclerotic communist economy, but you did have a state pension that's no longer existent. And there were people that were left out of that transition. That's something that they should have thought of and that anybody should think of when you're transitioning systems. The other bit is that they didn't go from a... Uh, a shitty sclerotic communist economy to a market economy, they went to a crony capitalist economy where they just gave businesses to whoever was buddies with the guy, which was a horrible way to do it. In a situation like China, where you had like, I think it's either 20 or 50 million people starving to death under Mao, they should have ripped that Band-Aid off as quick as they could because people were dying from the economic decisions there. That was something that needed to happen pronto. And in terms of uh, Argentina, uh, again, I, I think that there's a point to be made there. What I would push is that, one, the, the inflation is a really, really big issue there, that, that inflation is an incredibly regressive tax on poor people, that um, it, it stops anybody from saving money. It, it just It's bad for all sorts of reasons. And so that, to me, would be my top priority if I were looking at the Argentinian economy. And what I would try to couple it with is some kind of safety net for people that are at the bottom. But in terms of the, the actual rollout, you'd have to talk to me about the details because I don't know enough to be able to answer it. Seize the means, coward, writes. One of the industries Javier Melier is trying to privatize is the national airline. He wants to do this by giving it to the union workers to own as a cooperative. Surprise, surprise, they don't want the responsibility of ownership in a profit and loss system. Socialists do not have the courage of their convictions. The world over, when told that they can own the circumstances of their employment through collective action, they agitate for the same arrangement as crony capitalists to reap the rewards of success and foist the losses of failure onto the taxpayer. This doesn't seem like a fair analysis because you're just labeling them all as socialists and saying mean things about socialists. And I mean, there's plenty of people that work for cooperatives and are very happy with doing it. You can label them whatever you want. I don't know what's actually going on with the union workers, but I don't think that this is a I mean, you label them socialists. You assign, you know, negative. um... Socialist is not a dirty word in Latin America. No, it shouldn't be a dirty word. It's just different ways of looking at running an economy. And I just, I, I, I am not a fan of looking at economics in the same way as religion and just being like, this is how it's supposed to be. And it's just like, there's different ways of running an economy. You can, uh, you can experiment with different ways and you can do different things like cooperatives or, you know, full blown private systems with corporate boards. I mean, you can run companies in different ways. So, um, yeah, I, you just lost me at socialists don't have the courage of their convictions. That just sounds like tribalism to me, and I you lost me. I'm not I'm not engaging with this. Public payment rights. I live in the Lehigh Valley region. Shout out to the morning call where I used to work. The most <laughs> average part of this oh so ho hum state of Pennsylvania. But in my local district, uh, we recently built a new middle school and expanded to elementary schools. In all cases, the athletic facilities have seen drastic improvements, despite the fact that only 10 to 15 percent of the students use them. The middle school is a massive complex and half the building is athletic, while the library has a maximum capacity of 45. Is this really a funding issue or is it an allocation issue? I mean, I think it's an allocation issue. And, and this is emblematic of the whole entire American governmental experience. Uh, I don't have the figures right off the top of my head, but I'm fairly confident that if you look at the per pupil spending on the United States on secondary and primary education, that it is equal to or greater than the per pupil spending in Canada or the United Kingdom or Australia. If not, it's within the same ballpark. And you can you can scale that up that when you look at the per citizen spending of the United States is pretty much the same as it is in the United Kingdom or France. It's not that the government's not spending stuff. It's that we spend it on stupid stuff, which is part of my whole thing is like, I would fucking love, I would fucking love if the government was so competent that I overpaid in taxes every year, knowing that I don't even have to bother looking into what charity to give money to because the federal government would be such a good steward of that money. I do not think we're there. And so I want it to operate well. And, and I would say, yes, you, you are correct. It is an allocation issue, not a, a question of the actual funding being raised. Sounds like a bunch of nerd talk. <laughs> Look, we got to we, we gotta produce quarterbacks and oh, uh, I, I, I will somehow. say, quick, quick asterisk just to head off emails to there. There are, there are specific parts of the country that are underfunded. There are parts of Oklahoma that are one of them. Uh, I, the limited government guy, would raise taxes in Oklahoma, at least in certain instances, because like we had some counties a few years ago where the, the uh, student week had gone down to four days per week because they couldn't afford to pay the teachers. In a situation like that, there is a funding issue, and you should raise taxes in order to do it. But by and large, though, I think we're, we're pissing away money through incompetency rather than not raising enough money.
I would also be curious to know if these schools are actual public schools or charter schools, because we have seen that with the structure of charter schools, there is a profitability avenue by putting a lot of public money into your facilities. Um, so I am curious to see if these are actual real public schools or the fake ones, um, because we have seen that be a problem with charter schools. So I would not be shocked either way. Yeah. Das Argentine brings us home on this subject. Something that was lost in the conversation about people in Argentina experiencing a lot of economic turmoil over the decades is the fact that a lot of older people in Argentina had faced economic turmoil throughout their entire lives. Back in the 1920s and 1930s, many of these old people now living in Argentina grew up in a country where they faced rampant hyperinflation, massive unemployment, and a large drop in living standards. In 1919, one loaf of bread cost one mark. By 1923, the same loaf of bread cost 100 billion marks in the mid 1940s many of the people fled their own war-torn country with nothing but the hugo boss uniforms on their backs and some gold or ancient artifacts that they would have acquired in a totally ethical way wink <laughs> they found safe haven in argentina to live a better life if the young people of today in argentina have it bad perhaps they should ask the senior citizen just how bad they had it when they were kids although spanish is probably not the best language to ask them in so the implication to this is just Argentinians are Nazis? I'm not entirely sure what to do with this. Yeah, I don't... Uh, I don't yes, either. yes, that is the implication here, is that uh -huh. uh, uh, Ar Argentina, or, or Argentina was uh, heavily populated by uh, German refugees. I did not know in that. In the uh, mid oh, that's, that's true. They got a lot of German refugees. I think about 10,000 oh, yeah. Nazis fled to South America. Uh, following World yeah. War II. But I, I, yeah, I don't know what to do with that economic... I bet you they got a lesson on humidity. Holy shit. Those 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 Hugo Boss uniforms don't breathe. No, not at all. No, snappy, but not from this. not breathable. <laughs> Uh, on PTO, Forbidden writes, the last job I had with PTO changed the rules of how much could be carried over year to year and had the ability to take time off entirely depended on local leadership. Due to several periods of short staffing from the central organization not sending us new people when old ones left, we had several long six to nine month periods where leave was forbidden. I had to beg to get my mandated paternal leave when my daughter was born in the middle of one of these periods. I had something similar happen at my building because the thing was like we were allowed to take vacation but we would screw over everything everyone else when we did so as a you know being loyal to the team mm -hmm. we just wouldn't take our vacation basically corporate life sucks quiet working rights i have a friend who works in tech she is hired to work five days a week and works from home three of them her job monitors her activities at home but she routinely gets the work done in about three to six hours she makes the mouse move around on screen then smokes weed and plays video games for the rest of the work day not exactly a full quiet vacation but definitely paid break time she recently got promoted she gets her work done you go girl yeah, blaze it. Work versus life. As a society, we decided that the work week was too long and developed a 40-hour-a-week 40 weeks, 40 hour a week standard. Then the standard became 80 hours a week as most households became dual income. We need more time to tend to home life. That is a daily need, not a weekly one. Instead of four tens or four eights or five, six, and six and a halves would be better. That also gives people the flexibility to realistically have two full-time jobs if they so choose and without oh. the need to slowly kill themselves in the process. I would rather die than have two full-time jobs. Just um, take me out. Well, you have one podcast. I know, and it's breaking <laughs> me. I burned out this year. Yeah, <laughs> I would not be able to handle it. Uh, uh, I, little, little caveat there. I, I think that it would be great if we moved towards a four-day work week, if that became a norm. Um, uh, but I, I do want to like put a little bit of economic spin on what you just said there. Um, the idea that we, we had a period where there was one household earner and the, the woman stayed home. Keep in mind that at that time, a significant amount of that, that lady's day was spent doing things that are now automated. So you, you sort of needed that. Um, and now we live in a situation where you have all these gadgets, but you have to pay for them. So I, I, don't, I think it's very difficult to make one-to-one -one ratios when we're looking back in the past when we don't have the same technology, we don't have the same size houses. Like it's oftentimes comparing apples to diving boards. But broadly speaking... I think it would be great if we, you know, had a four day work week. And finally, pick and choose writes, in my experience, the best way to avoid employee burnout is to give the individual employees more control. A great way to accommodate Justin and Jen's of the world is to let the employees buy an optional week of PTO in addition to the standard package. Let the employee decide whether they'd have money or time. I think that would work. Justin would take the money. I would take the time. I would take I, Jen's money. 
I think this is <laughs> a great idea. Would. <laughs> I would, I would, I would say, Jen, you can. I'd sell you my PTO. I would take it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love this email. I completely agree with that because, like, I've had like there were points in my life where I really needed the money, and I'd be like, no, I'd rather work. And then there were other times in my life where I was like, can I take a ten percent pay cut and just have a day off a week or something like that? Like, I think depending on where you are, yeah, love this, love this. You're in charge of the economy, guy. Or gal. Uh, We're Not Wrong is a production of Dog and Pony Show Audio. Our editor is Will Saddleberg on PX3 this week. We are uh, going over some of the Trump polls and the behaviors of uh, the campaigns after the convictions. And on Friday, Ryan Macbeth is on the show explaining why the military industrial complex is not what you think and might not exist. What? What? Yeah. I'm going to okay. fucking spite watch this. I'm going to yeah. spite this in your program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it, 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 it's a it's a really good conversation. I think Ryan's a smart guy, and his uh, yeah, I'll let him speak for his point. Nice, okay, Jen. So I actually put a surprise episode out on Congressional Dish because in my research for an episode I'm working on about Boeing, I listened to a national uh, National Safety Transportation Board. Is that what it's called? Na- yeah. NTSB. Yeah. NTSB. Yeah. Um, but basically, those are the people that investigate accidents and tell us how things went wrong. And in this hearing where they did talk about Boeing, they talked about a bunch of other things. And I had a handful of clips that I was like, I just want to play these for people because they're kind of mind blowing. And so I made an episode out of it. And um, yeah, so you can listen to those. There's an update on the East Palestine situation, which blew my mind. Um, Some stuff about electric vehicles. Um, there are some downsides to electric Jim, vehicles. You can't stay away from about. Palestine when you get out of the Middle East. You zero in on <laughs> Palestine. Ohio. Oh, what is, is wrong with East you? One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's just really fascinating clips that I heard in this hearing and I didn't want to wait to share. So that's what's waiting for you. I enjoyed it. Heaton. So two things. If you enjoyed the Trump trial analysis, I have two hours of that on the political orphanage this week. I brought on two attorney friends of mine, uh, my friend Anna Gorish, who's an immigration attorney and, and a, a brilliant and funny woman, and my friend Paul Townsend, who is my personal defense attorney for when I commit crimes in New York, which I do more of knowing that he's my defense attorney. That's how good he is. So we do an exhaustive breakdown of that. However, if you've already had your fill of that, given our wonderful discourse that we had on this program today, uh, we are bringing back my other funny history podcast, Losers, Pretenders, and Scoundrels. We are kicking off season two this week. This is a podcast I do with my friend Andrew Young. We pick interesting characters from history, and then we laugh at them. This week's is John Romulus Brinkley, who became rich and famous, (laughs) rich and famous, as a goat testicle transplant doctor of the 20th century. It's a, it, there's absolutely no substance to it whatsoever. It is the equivalent of, of eating like pixie dust candy for an hour. There's, you will learn nothing. You will gain nothing. But it's really fucking funny. And that is a show called Losers, Pretenders, and Scoundrels. We're kicking off season two. There we go. Well, for Jen Briney and Andrew Heaton, I'm Justin Robert Young, reminding you as always, we're not wrong.